The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the closing session of the ASLA conference webinar series, ASLA presents Vision 2020, Libraries Moving Forward. My name is Carly Scarborough, and I'm the head campus librarian at Cochise College, Douglas Campus. I'm also the webinar series chair and the program committee chair. I would like to begin by introducing some of the many people who made this two month long series possible. This group has overcome a multitude of challenges from the pandemic to a stay at home order and all the other stressful issues that followed. Our main goal remained the same throughout the series to provide quality professional development for our ASLA members and to safely gather together in a time where we are safer being apart. Through per perseverance, this group accomplished that goal and presented such a well-organized, successful event, they need to be commended and congratulated. First, I would like to thank the webinar series committee, my co-chair on the programming committee, Karen Grondin. Karen and I have been meeting weekly for what seems like eternity, planning every detail, and without her, I would have not made it. Thank you, Karen. It has been a pleasure working on this project with you and I look forward to our work together for our next conference. I'd also like to thank the rest of the group on the program committee who have been working tirelessly from the start, Justina Nolan Brown and Natalie Menges. Patty Jimenez of the professional development chair, um, thank you so much to our committee cohorts, we did it. I would also like to thank Danielle Angerbauer, our ASLA admin, Holly Henley, the state librarian, and our Arizona State Library team, the U of A interns, the presenters of the webinars, and the many others who helped organize this production. Thank you all so much for what you have done to help make this year's conference events such a great success. So our first slide we're gonna go is our technical few housekeeping details. One second, there we go. Before we get started, uh, webinar participants are in listen only mode. So there will be opportunity for Q&A at the end of each presentation. Please submit questions via the questions box in the control panel and the moderators will keep an eye on that throughout the presentation. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Library Association page and information will be provided in a follow-up email. Today, Matthew Diekman will be our technical director. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact him via the chat box or the questions box. And if you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number and access code you see on your screen, um, although the webinar does function better online. Okay. So before I introduce Dr. John Walsh, we would like to begin our closing session as we did with our opening session um, with an acknowledgement of the 22 native nations and communities that have inhabited Arizona lands for centuries. We honor the people of these nations and communities on whose ancestral homelands and resources as the member libraries were built. We welcome the indigenous peoples into the library, recognizing their knowledge and land while we look forward to further engaging with them. Today, we benefit from the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary homelands of the Akchen Indian community, Yavapai Apache Nation, Navajo Nation, Cocopa Tribe, Colorado River Tribes, White Mountain Apache Tribe, Fort McDowell, Yavapai Nation, Fort Mojave Tribe, Gila River Indian community, Havasupai Tribe, Hopi Tribe, Hualapai Tribe, Kaibab Paiute Tribe, Pasquayaki Tribe, Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, San Carlos Apache Tribe, Tohono O'odham Nation, Tonto Apache Tribe, Yavapai Prescott Tribe, Quechon Tribe, Pueblo of Zuni, and San Juan Southern Paiute Tribe. We recognize, support, and advocate for Indian nations in Arizona. We acknowledge that ASLA member libraries are occupants of these ancestral lands of the 22 federally recognized tribal communities. 
and we will take active steps to forge relationships of reciprocity. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold the Arizona Library Association members more accountable to the information needs of American Indian and Indigenous peoples. So I would now like to introduce Dr. John Walsh, Director of Library Services at Cochise College Libraries and our current ASLA president, who will be giving our opening remarks and introducing today's keynote speaker. We hope that you enjoy our closing session. Whoa, huh. that's kind of uh, dark, huh? Sorry about that, guys. Thank you, Carly. Um, and uh, great thanks to uh, your team and all they put into this series. What an excellent job after all the challenges. Good morning, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for attending our closing session today. I will be, <clears throat> I am so looking forward to our inspirational keynote this morning, so I'll not be taking very much of your time. I'll start by saying how delighted I am to be here with you all and to be part of this organization. This year, I have witnessed so much great work being done by our members and the libraries in the state. Thanks to Zoom, I have visited with many in public libraries, academic libraries, tribal libraries, and with some school librarians. I've heard their inspirational stories about the increasingly innovative ways to continue to deliver services in their communities from closed buildings. Like Melanie Toledo of Akchin Indian Community Library, who wanted to spread a little Halloween cheer to her community and set up a variety of inflatables in front of our library, hoping Akchin families would walk or drive by in the evenings to enjoy them. Or like Emily Duchon of the Sierra Vista Public Library, who has curbside delivery of a weekly program of craft kits for children and adults. These are just a couple of the examples of the passion I have observed in our members and the library staffs throughout the state. I have a newfound admiration for all Arizona librarianship and am more than inspired. I'm driven to do whatever I can to advocate for and strengthen our position both locally and nationally. I want to thank all library staff for their service to their communities, your commitment to the betterment of <clears throat> and the strengthening of your communities is what drives me. You're all truly inspiring. As we continue in the ever widening wake of COVID, let us mark this day. Let this closing session of our webinar series be the beginning of our rise to move the boundaries of librarianship as we move forward. Let's lead this effort from Arizona. Let this also be the beginning of the rise of ASLA to take its place as one of the strongest state chapters in the nation. To that end, I'll be reaching out to all libraries in an effort to bring us all together under the umbrella of ASLA, forming a true statewide information ecosystem where all types of libraries, library workers, and volunteers that provide services to all types of communities form a network of supporting each other and making each other stronger. Library workers are ASLA guys. We are ASLA, not the buildings or our services. We are. We build strong libraries and strong libraries build stronger communities. I so look forward to meeting with as many library workers as possible over this next year. And I hope to see you all at the 2021 annual that with any luck will be held on October 27th through the 29th in Prescott, Arizona. Be well and be safe, everyone. Now, it is my honor to introduce today's keynote, Jamie LaRue. Jamie is the CEO of LaRue and Associates and author of The New Inquisition, Understanding and Managing Intellectual Freedom Challenges. He was a public library director for many years, as well as a weekly newspaper columnist and a cable TV host. From January 2016 to November 2018, he was the director of the Freedom to Read Foundation, 
and ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom. He has written, spoken, and consulted extensively on intellectual freedom issues, leadership, and organizational development, community engagement, and the future of libraries. Jamie's presentation today is titled, What's Next? Building Community Through the Pandemic. He discusses the timely topic on many of our minds, how essential are our services after ebook pricing travesties, declining circulation, stagnant or falling funding, amidst a rising tide of anti-science, civic Ill illiteracy, and par partisan polarity. Now, what role should the library play to build healthier communities? Welcome, Jamie. Well, thanks so much, John. I sure appreciate the introduction. And so um, I see that um, I have, you're handing over the screen to me. So I wanted to make sure I've got this up and running. Okay, so I'm hoping at this point that what you're seeing is one full screen of a slide. Okay, so um, as John mentioned, what I'll be doing today is talking about um, building community through the pandemic. The lens of my talk is not just the future, but it's about ways in which we have discovered new ways to connect to our communities. So I like mind maps a lot, and the way that I use them, I start at the one o'clock position, I go clockwise around to noon, and every time that I open up one of those branches, I'm reading from the top to the bottom. So kind of as John had mentioned here, let's see if I can move my control panel out of the way. Um, before the pandemic, the library still had some issues, and as John kind of uh, summarized some of those, oops, let me go back one. Uh, I've traveled quite a lot across the United States over the past four or five years, and we are really seeing a decline of circulation even before the pandemic. Much of that was a result, I think, of the ebook costs and big deal pricing. And what that basically meant was that as the ebook was coming into our collections, we were finding that the cost was rising, which meant we were buying fewer books. When you have less inventory, you're going to have less use. So that was one of the big problems we were facing. Almost all of us in the school library community, academic community, and public, we've seen flat or falling revenues. And this is, goes all the way back to 1965 and the rise of a very strong anti-tax sentiment captured in the phrase tax burden. There's only tax burden and tax relief. We've also been uh, recognizing as our communities have begun to change, and as of 2014, under the age of five, America is a majority non-white nation. Our libraries still don't reflect that reality. Our collections still are very biased towards kind of the WASP kind of background. Our staff too is not as diverse as our communities. And that's been an issue for us for quite some time. I also saw when I was the director of the Office for Intellectual Freedom that we really are seeing a declining support for intellectual freedom across our entire society. Pan America did a study in 2016, and they found that although support for social justice is rising, as referenced by that lack of diversity and a very open, diverse generation that is rising, support for intellectual freedom is falling. I've been talking to some LIS um, instructors and professors, and I see that they too are kind of de-emphasizing intellectual freedom in favor of social justice. And in particular, um, I began to notice that there was quite a trend in intellectual freedom where it's administrators who are preemptively censoring their staff or their collections because they are terrified of controversy. Institutions are often punished. I wrote a book about this called The New Inquisition. It used to be that institutions um, performed an inquisition on individuals, and now it's kind of the other way around. All of us feel that we have been threatened. This rising tide of civic illiteracy, I think, is a very significant one. A Pew report a couple of years ago found that the general trust of institutions, not only public institutions, but media, education, banking, are all losing trust, particularly among Republicans. Very few people have ever worked at a polling place, or it seems, understand much at all about our voting system. So it's important to remember that librarians, at least so far, are still among the most trusted of American institutional workers. I worked with the Maine State Library a few years ago, and they sent out a survey to all of their libraries and said, who do you trust? 
and first on the list was nurses, second was firefighters, I think because of the calendars, and third was librarians. So that's an asset that we really need to try to maintain. Increasing polarity, it's hard to find, it's hard to avoid the evidence of this one. Pick up any newspaper, watch any news program, you can see that we are a sharply divided nation. In response to all of these challenges for a long time, uh, libraries were saying, well, what do we do? How do we deal with declining circulation? And in general, our response has been, we have made a shift to a community gathering space. And so the idea in public libraries, we were the community's living room. In school libraries and academic libraries, it was moving towards this learning commons. So we were backing away from the traditional notion of being a repository of books and moving into this idea that we were a place where people could come together. And then came the first wave of the pandemic. And now that we had decided that we were putting all of our bets on the building, we had to close the buildings. And I remember watching this as I was seeing a lot of libraries that started to close. They said, you know, the library is closed, but that was not quite true. The buildings were closed. The library itself, many of its assets, were still available to the community. And so we took a fresh look at our digital content and to their credit, some publisher restrictions about the use of digital content eased. And so we began to say, well, we can't necessarily give you a lot of these books, but by God, we've got some digital content for you. The other big area that we began to recognize is say, well, we've still got some staff here. The staff was mostly retained, but uh, we said, well, how do we deliver programs? And I was startled and very delighted to find out that many libraries that say they would have three story times a week and five people would come to each session. They said, well, what happens if we put this up on Zoom and we just do one story time, but then monitored its use? And that same library that I had been talking to that had 15 people a week now had a thousand people a week that were looking at the story time because the kids were home. And at least in those places where there was access to technology, they could gain access to this computer and see the, the live story time. And what they wound up doing was reaching over a thousand people a week. We also learned that uh, there's this wonderful thing in Zoom called the gallery view, where instead of just watching one speaker, you could say, I want to see all of the speakers at once. And that kind of helped us give that sense that we were actually connected to each other. Um, the Zoom programming was mostly on the public side. And in addition to story times, we branched into some things like panel discussions and other kinds of programs that would lend themselves to this digital format. And we also discovered that we were we could connect to our staff in ways that hadn't been possible before. Again, assuming that our staff had access to the technology, we began to have regular weekly meetings with all staff in ways that might not have been possible before. It gave us a way to connect to each other without having to get into a car and drive somewhere and dress up and all that stuff. So we began to see some of the power here. I was also intrigued um, watching that first wave when the pandemic was starting to rise. There were many discussions that were happening in libraries around the country about what is an essential service. I'm sad to say that probably about half of the libraries, mostly those of those uh, um, libraries under city control, were kind of shut down and there wasn't much that they could do. Staff were told to stay home. They were told that they were not working. But in other places, and I was talking to the library director of Montrose, uh, Colorado, and he said that he was gathering with a group of county officials and they were talking about what is essential services? What do we need to be focusing on at this time? And the county health department looked at the library director and said, we're so glad that you're here because we believe that you are the front line of defense for mental health. We've learned that as people become homebound, more and more isolated, what that means is that um, they start to get a little loony and reaching out to them, providing things like home delivery, staying in touch with them is a vital sign for us that the community is staying together. So I believe that um, those libraries that stepped up to that problem and said, we want to be a critical essential service, quickly found that there was strong support for that in the larger power structure. In the second and third waves, things loosened up a little bit. We started offering curbside services, and there began to be more of a focus that I saw on communications. And so here the idea was uh, libraries started sending out email newsletters. Uh, the first one that Denver Public sent to me was, we're not closed. 
the building is closed. And then my favorite story about this is, again, to the north of us here in Colorado, and I know this is not the only place where it happened. The Anything Library took a look at their database and said, you know, we have the birth year in our patron records. Let's generate a list of everybody who's over 65 years old. They ran off the list, and then they had staff that didn't have library operational duties in the building, said, but let's use them to make phone calls. And they called 8,000 seniors. And all that they said was, this is the library. We're calling to find out how are you doing? And the uh, patrons who answered the phone on this were delighted to get the call from the building and they had long conversations that might go for an hour or more. And during which time the library would say, do you know about audiobooks? Do you know about ebooks? Do you have an ebook reader? Do you have access to a computer? Do you know that we have programs that are available to you? Do you know that we have curbside services? And after that round, I talked to other libraries that said, we just made a list of all the regulars, the people that came in to see us every day and now couldn't come in to see us and did the same thing. Reached out to them to say, what, uh, how are you doing? Um, here's some of the, here's where we are with our services. Is there anything that we can do for you? And this, I believe, is the secret to civic engagement, is to use the liberated labor of our staff to say, we have ways to reach out to you to stay in touch. In the third wave, we kind of have moved into a limited reopening, although that too, of course, is a challenge now. Um, but we found that it wasn't so much people coming in to want to hang out for things. We had, you know, separated a lot of our computers and moved the chairs aside and done deep cleaning. But much, much of the uh, challenge that we received for use was people who did not have technical access um, at home. They didn't have Wi-Fi. They didn't have a laptop. And so people were coming in to touch base with other members of their family and other community resources by making it by uh, using our community computers. So that's kind of where we were going with the um, that whole first wave. Now I want to move to the, the next one and that's that I've been consulting for a few years now and much of my work lately is very much focused on this turning outward. As I often say, it is not the job of the community to make a great library. It's the job of a library to make a great community. And that's true whether it's in a public environment, an academic environment, a school or a special. We live to serve. So I began to realize that one of the things that people really wanted to hear from us is that people wanted conversations. And I began to develop this uh, idea about a civic engagement strategy that was based on interviews. Now there are a variety of civic engagement strategies. Harwood, of course, is well known, the Aspen Institute. And over the past few years, I've been trying to find a way that libraries connect with people through what we already know. We already know how to do. And that's a reference interview. Three of my most interesting clients lately, by the way, have been in Arizona, and all of them have remarkable leadership. I want to give a shout out to Prescott Valley, which was my first one in Arizona, Sedona, and Camp Verde. So with community interviews, what this is about is the power of conversation. The basic idea is this. If you talk to a lot of people, you can't help but start to find patterns. And that means you begin to make meaning. We have long collected materials and created metadata for them, but people are resources too. And they too need to be cataloged. That's what this is about. This is inventorying and describing the wisdom of the people in our communities who gain their wisdom by talking to a lot of other people. So community interviews, I'll talk about both the process and the ways that I've seen it used. And the first one, the process is this. I would begin by saying, okay, staff, leadership, boards, let's brainstorm. Who are the movers and shakers in, in your community? And I would often give them categories to say, well, okay, let's start with business leaders. Let's talk with education leaders, principals, superintendents. Let's talk with elected and appointed officials. Sometimes the elected person is the one who has the power. Sometimes it's the appointed official and sometimes it's the person who helped the elected official get elected. Um, talk to nonprofit leaders. There's a tremendous number of non-for-profit non organizations in all of our communities who are doing often vital work. If we reach out and talk to them, we can find out about the issues that they're dealing with. 
we also talked to faith-based organizations and uh, to kind of give you an example of what this was about years ago in douglas county when we first sent this out we were talking to a presbyterian minister and said you know what have you learned about uh, about your people and what lessons what wisdom do you have about what's happening in our community and he said something really surprising he said what i see in douglas county colorado is grief and i and uh, reference like Rand said grief you know but we're well to do we're you know fairly well educated uh, what how do you how does that grief manifest itself and he said well in 1965 douglas county only had 5000 people now there are 300,000 people nobody is from here nobody knows anybody else and so they feel like they need to go home regularly to be recharged they are grieving the loss of connection and I would argue that of the many, many ways to find out what's on the community's mind, like surveys, it would be very difficult to get to that kind of deep insight. That's not a checkbox on a form. That's something that requires real insight and thinking. So once we would develop this uh, list of movers and shakers, which also included like civic groups in various categories, I would try to get the organization to come up with some 30 to 50 names. Now, please understand that this is not st statistically significant. 50 people isn't a uh, reliable indicator of what everybody is thinking, but it's far less work and it's far cheaper to go out and talk to people than it is to do these comprehensive surveys, try to generate a bunch of data and then never look at it again. I find that when you're having these conversations with people, you get deeper and deeper into the meaning of things. The other thing that began to happen now, um, as I've been working with some of my uh, more recent clients, these movers and shakers are by definition the power structure of the community. But now let's go back to that notion about equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, many libraries are now also starting to seek out interviews with more marginalized populations. So that's tribal leaders, it's people of color, it's the homeless, it's the queer community. Those populations may not have the same influence right now in more established community uh, as as more established community leaders but they do help identify emerging issues and talking to them gives them access to new platforms for discovery and influence so then we would say okay now we have the list of movers and shakers and then i would say now i want you to call them up um, and we would give this assignment to staff mostly reference librarians but it doesn't have to be reference librarians we would call up and say we are seeking your wisdom we wish to talk with you because you know some things and then typically we would say and now we are going to leave the building we're going to go out of the library we're going to go to your place of business and we're going to say please tell us what your thoughts are and i find that as i, I customize this a little bit every time i put together a google form for this sort of a sheet that two reference librarians would take with them for the interviews but the questions basically come down to some version of these three. The first one is, please tell us how you got here. How did you come to live in this community? Where were you before? And this is the beginning of real relationship management. This is being systematic about saying, where do you come from? Um, building a relationship between the face of the library and one of these community leaders. The second question is, as you think about your constituents, and by constituents, I just mean your people, the folks you serve, the folks you think about, the folks you talk to, as you think about them, what do you think their key concerns, their key issues will be over the next 18 to 24 months? And I put out that time period because it's close enough to now so that the things that everybody's talking about today will probably show up. But it encourages uh, those leaders to think about, well, what seems to be the trend here? Where do we seem to be going? Um, so after all of that uh, conversation goes on, and I found that those three questions, plus maybe the more, um, you know, anytime you do a reference interview, it's going to wander a little bit. And you're going to go off and find other avenues to explore. And that's good. That's what this process is about. It takes about an hour with just those three questions and follow-up reference interviews to have a very deep and rich conversation with people in your community. And I should also say, and I'll talk more about this later, but inevitably as you know, people at first they're a little stiff when they start talking to you, but then they begin to warm up because they are talking about the things that matter to them. 
We're talking about the things that they are passionate about. And inevitably, about 15, 20 minutes into this, they stop and they look at you and they say, I'm sorry, who are you again? Where are you from? And the librarians would say, well, we're from the library. And the people would say, and why are you doing this? And the library staff would say, we're doing this because we want to understand our operating environment. We want to understand what's going on around us. And we hope to find a place where we can add value. And at that moment, a profound shift happens in the minds of those community leaders. They're used to public entities saying, we need more money, or gee, the library is really important. You need to think about us. But in that moment, they say, I never thought of the library as a tool to accomplish the things that matter to me. This is the beginning of advocacy. Not saying library, 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 but saying we exist to help identify and to fulfill your aspirations for the community. Very, very powerful. After the interviews, and people have taken copious notes, I create kind of a Google form so that they can type all this data in which immediately then populates a Google spreadsheet so we can track who was spoken to at what time and all of their answers to these questions. After the 30 or 50 or so um, people that have been spoken with, now we move into the analysis piece. And typically this is a staff guided process and I kind of tend to function as a moderator. And here we're trying to say, how do we take those, all of these rich conversations Go back to the spreadsheet, read it through five or six or seven or eight times, highlight all the words to keep showing up. And very quickly, after about 17 or so, I notice that there's strong convergence. We begin to hear the same themes over and over again. As I said, I, I've done this process for communities that have only 300 people. I've done it with 300,000 people. And it doesn't seem to matter how large the community is. There are always people that are working on exactly the same thing who have never talked to each other. And so uh, in that analysis, you begin to say, OK, now I understand the themes. So then you invite all of the people back to get a debrief. You present the findings of this analysis. Now, in the old days, and I should I, I have to back up for a bit to say this interviewing at the location before the pandemic, the librarians went to somebody's office after the pandemic that of course was not possible most people that i talked to have chosen then to just move over to the phone the phone is very familiar to people there's no that kind of, you don't have that kind of technological barrier some people have done it on zoom and some people like uh, judy in sedona says you know we live in arizona it's a nice day let's find a nice sunny spot to sit on a bench and talk to each other so in much the same way you can't now debrief by inviting everybody to the library because they still probably can't come in right now. But we've done this as a Zoom session, or it doesn't have to be Zoom, it could be, well, it does have to be something that enables people to see each other and to talk and to ask questions. And so that process of the debrief is to say, this is what you told us. Did we get it right? And that gives the um, community members, the leaders, an opportunity to say, no, um, it's really more like this, or yes, that's absolutely right, or yes, and I've thought of something new. And so there's a very rich conversation that takes place. In this process of the debrief, something else wonderful happens. And that is you begin to do the creation of a community agenda. And again, I tend to talk about this in public library terms, but I've seen the same kind of thing work in academic and in school libraries. The community there is just the community of the campus. And what you say is that, so if this is one of the key themes, who else is working on that? As I mentioned, that's when we discovered somebody looks at somebody else and says, gee, I didn't know you were working on that too. We should get together and talk. But they also begin to say, huh, there is a consistent framework here of a community agenda, the issues that matter to everybody. And that creation of a community agenda is the moment at which a library moves from an interviewer cataloging the community to somebody who has now assumed a leadership role. We have made relationships with you. We have clarified our concerns and we're beginning to find ways that we can move forward on after that debrief, the staff takes all of that information, goes back to the um, community, 
uh, goes back to uh, talk to themselves and says, as we look at all of these issues, where there are three questions, I guess I think about the library says first, which of these issues is something that fits in the library wheelhouse, something that actually we have expertise, we're good at this, it fulfill, it's part of our mission, and it's a place where we can make a difference. In our wheelhouse, we're good at it, we can make a difference. And then they develop staff initiatives. And uh, in Prescott Valley in particular, I found this was a fascinating process where they all broke up and said, what can we do to support these initiatives? How do we align the entire culture of our organization so that we are all rowing in the same direction? A rowing analogy in the desert may not be the best, but you get my idea that we're all heading in the same place. And then after that, uh, the staff takes these initiatives to a board, if they work for a board, or whatever their governing authority is to get that blessed and then begin to do it. So what I have seen in this process, and I've kind of collapsed all this, but it's a, it could be anywhere from a three-month to a nine-month process, depending upon how many people you talk to and how much staff capacity you have. And I should say, during the pandemic, some libraries, uh, Camp Verde was one of them, was able to do what I've seen libraries take five months to do. They did it in one month because they had all of their staff were working with them. So how has it, how, how has this uh, technique been used? I mentioned one of them is advocacy. Advocacy is not pounding on the table and asking for money. It's identifying those concerns and demonstrating your willingness to help them achieve their goals. Most frequently, uh, one of the libraries I worked with in Illinois, it was simply a strategic planning process. They'd heard for a long time about, let's not be library-centric in our thinking, let's be community-centric in our thinking. And um, then they put together a strategic plan that they really want to demonstrate the value of the library to the community. Um, the next one is uh, Judy, this is in Sedona. Um, Judy came in as an assistant director. She's about to become the director in January, I believe, when the current director retires. And she says, I really want to use this as an opportunity to establish my presence in the community, to meet some of these movers and shakers, to get a good sense of what this environment is going to be like and what we can do around it. So it's a wonderful way to introduce yourself to the community. In Camp Verde, where uh, Kathy is fairly well known, has been there for a few years, she, I think, really has used this as more of as a staff development tool. And I found that just fascinating, too, because uh, often what we find, and this was the case with my own staff uh, back in Douglas County, when I first suggested I needed reference librarians to leave the building and go talk to these other people, they were like, well, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. But once they left and then they returned to a person, they came back excited. They said, just as we have been doing this one-on-one -on -one individual transactions with people with reference questions and get a wonderful kind of sense of service because we got into this business because we believe in service. They begin to see this possibility that, you know, maybe we're not just helping individuals, we're helping whole efforts, whole community organizations, a very, very powerful shift. And that makes your, staff far more able to not only tap the resources on your shelf or the resources in your digital collections, but the resources within your community. You become connectors to take one people that are working on the same issues and put them in the same room that they're talking to each other. And then finally, I think, uh, I believe it's in the best interest of the library, lest we become too blinded by our own concerns, say, let's make this part of an ongoing process. Maybe we come back every two years, maybe it's every three years, or maybe we do like one or two of these interviews every month in perpetuity. The point is, if you can make that connection to somebody and have them know that they are being heard, this is a very, very powerful way for you to make sure that you don't get out of step with your community. I view this very much um, as a kind of a dance. Sometimes the community learns a new step and you have to struggle to catch up. Sometimes you're a bit ahead of them and they have to catch up. But the only way to stay in sync with each other is to keep talking. Right, let me see if I can shift to the next one here. Okay, then around June, um, I started playing around with something else that's a little bit uh, 
It's another kind of community engagement strategy. It was a result of an experiment with a friend of mine named Mike McGuffey, and he's the founder of a group called Unite for Literacy. It's a social enterprise. You can find them at uniteforliteracy.com. And what they do basically is they uh, take ebooks that are formatted so they can show up on a cell phone. And you can also listen to them in up to 50 different languages. So they have 400 primary level books, like uh, picture books, but you can also listen to them in a variety of languages. And so I put out, out a call to the Association for Rural and Small Libraries back on June 30th. And I said, you know, we're looking for a cohort of people that are grappling with a number of different issues. You know, you're trying to figure out how to get digital content. You understand the deep significance of emergent literacy. And you begin to notice that there are new populations that may have moved into your community. It could be a rising uh, Latino community. It could be um, immigrants from Ghana. It could be a Hmong community. We say, if you want to find a way to reach out with them, we're looking for some people to do an experiment with this, to come in and be a cohort with us. And so we got 14 libraries that signed up almost immediately. And we started meeting pretty much on a weekly basis that went from that moment um, you know, where we were starting to say, here's what the goal of the, here's what we're thinking, here's some of the background. And Mike has done a great deal of research about uh, the significance of early literacy. And I'll stop for just a moment to say a little bit more about that. I, I think I addressed this the last time I spoke to the Arizona Library Association, but it continues to be a very powerful notion for me. The greatest single indicator for success in life, and success in life by which I mean health, how healthy you will be as a child, how long you will live as an adult, about um, productivity, how far you'll go in school, and uh, therefore, probably, how much money you're going to make and how much you will contribute to society. And the third one is um, oh, whether or not you're going to be in jail. The greatest, uh, the common denominator for people in our prison population is illiteracy. If you can get up to that fourth grade reading level and be proficient by fourth grade, you're probably not going to wind up in jail, statistically speaking. And so what we have found is that the greatest single effect that we can have is to get books into the home of a child between the ages of zero and five. And I've mentioned in the past uh, uh, this wonderful study that happened in 2010 from the University of Las Vegas in New Mexico was that if you can get uh, 500 books in the home of that child between the ages of zero and five, it's as good as having parents, having two parents with master's degrees. That means that you will be better educated. So uh, that's very, very powerful. And not everybody knows this. I believe that the greatest single contribution that libraries make to the well-being of our communities is the, the nurturing of early literacy, emergent literacy. So then, the, then one of our the fun things we did with the cohort is we began talking about something called the logic model. And some of you that may have had access to the research uh, in Public Libraries Institute, uh, research, I forget, uh, Ripple is what everybody calls it. And in Ripple, they said um, you, the logic model is something that helps you begin to organize all of your resources to accomplish a goal. And it basically focuses on what are your inputs, what are you contributing up front, what are the activities that begin to take advantage of all of those inputs? What are the outputs? What are the measurements of your success? And then finally, what is the major outcome that you are trying to achieve? How do you know that something was significant? And the difference between an input and output and an outcome, input is how many books do you have? And the output is what is the circulation per capita? And the outcome might be, what is the influence of all this on our graduation rates? If we want to have more people graduating, we need to get them proficient early on. I've also mentioned that that fourth grade reading level is the, the greatest single predictor for these things. But the best predictor of fourth grade proficiency is reading readiness by age five. And the best predictor of reading readiness is the number of books in the home. So this is a very, very powerful thing that libraries do, and we really need to claim that. So as most of the people uh, found as they were talking about this logic model and really trying to grapple with all the distinctions between these categories is that it's a marvelous project management tool. 
It helps you assemble your resources, it helps you deploy them intelligently, and it helps you make real change in your community. The logic model is also a wonderful tool for things like grant writing, because grants, as those of you know who are applying for them now, are very much about assessment these days. They really wanna know what's going on. So once we figured all this out, we said, okay, well, now tell us what is the issue that you're trying to solve and what is the outcome that you're looking for? And almost everybody came up with some version of this. Yes, we wanted to reach out to the people who didn't know about the library in our community. We wanted to involve them in coming to the library. We wanted to make available to them this wonderful resource of 400 eBooks that we can text around from one community member to the next, and that you can sit and read in English, but listen to in your native language. And ultimately, the thing that we were after was independent reading for fun. You know that you're making progress, not when kids are trudging dutifully and resentfully through some book that they never wanted to read in the first place, but following their interests and their passions themselves and looking forward to independent reading for fun. So then, um, United for Literacy, and this is not the commercial for them, but the things that they offer, is you can go right now to their website, uniteforliteracy.com, and there are 400 ebooks that anyone can use right now at no charge. If you want to add 400 books to your collection, go there. But there are some additional things that uh, we did through this cohort. One of them is the next level of just having access to a website is one thing, but uh, Unite for Literacy has the ability to embed all of those 400 things on a page on the library's website. And so it's a wonderful welcome to a new uh, community group that's coming into your community. Uh, the next thing that we said is now let's talk about what we've learned about ways to really reach out to people. And I have to say librarians as a group tend not to be the best marketers in the world. Um, I've, one of my favorite stories about this when I was trying to figure out a way to grow our market penetration beyond 51% was to say, well, let's be professional about our marketing. And I hired a group of people who came and talked to us about how best to market libraries. They said, give us all of your collateral. Give us everything you have ever done. Give us your what your library card looks like, what your overdue notices look like, what your signs on the doors look like, what your you know uh, sign outside the building looks like. We just want pictures of everything. And then after they looked at it for six weeks, they came back and said, boy, we thought librarians were smart. And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, do you need any kind of special training to be a librarian? I said, well, yes, of course, you know, there's an MLS. And she says, well, you need professional training to do graphic design too. And right now, most librarians, most libraries of all types tend to be very unsophisticated, tend to be amateurs. And she said, if you want to be really good about this, if you really want to you know, figure out a way to um, reach people and the transitions of their life so that they remember you, you have to be consistent. You have to have a logo that's always in the same place. It doesn't get stretched out. It doesn't change colors. You have to use two fonts instead of the 1,000 that came with your computer. And so this idea about trying to be very consistent about marketing is one of the ways that you begin to, um, you can't just send out a message and expect it to work. You have to be professional and intentional and thoughtful about it. So one of the things that we've learned in this process about reaching out to non-traditional users of the library or people who don't have the history of using libraries is that you need to find an inroad to that community. And so we talked a lot about, as a cohort, let's brainstorm all of the community organizations that already deal with that um, population. Do we have any inroads to that community at all? And to start looking for not just messages coming from us to you, but from people who are part of that community who can give you insights into it. And then you say to that liaison, we're gonna send to you um, one text message um, a week. And we want you to send that out to five other people. And that text message is a link to one of these books. And one of the things that United for Literacy did, I think uh, very timely, was they put together a series of COVID management things. How do you respond to, how do you wear a mask? How do you make a mask? 
uh, what does social distancing actually mean? And um, then as the liaison sends that out, we also have a way to map the networks of adoption. So there's always kind of a curve that happens for adoption. There are the early adopters, there are the folks who come in later, and you finally want to get up to that top of the curve where you're pushing them over the top where now it becomes a habit. So identify the size of that community and begin to track who are the people that are being reached out to by that by your liaison. And then finally, we could get to the point where uh, Unite for Literacy would provide a dashboard and that dashboard would allow you at any time to go in and say which titles were read, how many times were they read, were they read through to the completion, which languages were used, did people come back and visit this more than once. Now, I should emphasize that this is anonymized information. We don't know the exact patron that's using it, we just do the count, but we can say it's a unique user without knowing who exactly that is. And I mention all that because I think this is a wonderful package and an interesting way to go about trying to expand your civic engagement beyond your usual users. Okay, I'm racing through this a bit, I'm not sure why. Uh, what are the big conclusions that I've drawn from this? And the first one is this, I believe that everywhere in our communities, there is a strong thirst for meaningful conversation. And I'll stop and tell you a different story here since I have some extra time. Um, this is a story about Darby, Montana. And the new director who moved in there said she was in a very rural, very white ranching community in Montana. And she said, you know, I think our job here is to bring the world to Darby, to let people know what else is going on. And so she reached out to the Humanities Council and said, you know, what kind of programs do you have? And they said, oh, we've got some wonderful ones. And you know, here's, here's one that we've got a, an African-American cowboy. And he's lived in Montana all of his life. So they said, great, we'll start with him. So they advertised it and he talked about what it was like growing up black in a pretty rural white community. And, but he shared all the same concerns. He too was a rancher. 35 people showed up. And given the fact that there was a population of about 1,500 people in the county, not bad. So then they said, okay, that went pretty well. Let's try another program. And they brought in somebody who was a, a Chinese American and had been, his family had been there for five generations. He said, my family, my ancestors were the ones who helped build the railroads that went all the way through Montana to the coast. And he says, and then there was quite a period of very strong discrimination against my ancestors. Uh, but we, persevered through that and here I am. I'm a Chinese Montanan and I live here with you too. And about 50 people came up to that, very well received. And then they brought in somebody who was a um, Islamic scholar. He taught Arabic at one of the, at the University of Montana. And uh, Wendy, who was the director, um, said, okay, that's great. She announced that we're gonna have what it's like to be Muslim in Montana. And to her surprise, this one didn't go over so well because at, as soon as she made the announcement, there had been a returned Afghan, um, or an American vet who had served in Afghanistan. And he made a big fuss and he said, we, I've been over there and I know that these Muslims are just trying to take over America and they're trying to proselytize us. And how come we don't have a Christian coming to talk about what it's like to be Christian in Montana. And by God, we have to do something to stop this and it's not gonna happen on my watch. And he started circulating petitions, seven or eight people started helping him do the petitions. And Wendy was very thoughtful and she reached out to him and said, um, I'd like you to come and talk to our board. And he said, okay, I'll do that. And he says, this is wrong. And I said, well, here's the issue. Um, the reason we don't have a Christian coming to talk about this is because most of us are Christians. We know quite a lot about that. Just as an example, what's the difference between Protestant and Catholic? Well, the Catholics have the Pope. But when it comes to what's the difference between Sunni and Shia, we don't know. And so we're, this is educational. We just need to know what's going on in the rest of the world. And this is very much a strategic direction for the library. Well, he didn't buy it. And he, was, he said, no, I'm still going to continue to protest. And he said, OK. Well, then Wendy reached out to a bunch of very interesting folks. She reached out to the League of Women Voters. She reached out to um, the fire marshal. She said, how many people can I have in this building? And he said, well, given the size of your building, 
even if you move all the stacks off to the side and put in as many chairs as you possibly can, what you're going to see is a, a total of 150 people in the building. That's it, not a large library. She talked to the county sheriff and he said, would you like to have an armed presence? And she was like, no, that's not quite the tone we're going for. Um, I think it'd be best, uh, you know, just any other guidelines. And he said, well, set some ground rules at the beginning. And she also called the Office for Intellectual Freedom and spoke with us. So now it's the day. The meeting's gonna be at seven o'clock and she goes up to everybody and says, okay, you're gonna to have to leave at five because we have to move as much space as we make as much space available within the building as we can. And so set all that up for 150 chairs. And then she had a list of tickets with 150 tickets and stepped out to see how many people were waiting to get in and discovered there were 500 people waiting to get in. And again, pre-pandemic, obviously. And so they went out and handed out 150 tickets. And then as she looked at these other 350 people who couldn't get in, um, her board walked out carrying trays of hot cocoa and cookies. They made strong eye contact with every single person that they saw. And they said, we're so sorry that we don't have enough room in our building. Please have a cookie. This too is a powerful method for civic engagement, simple eye contact. And so they took their co cookies and they took their cocoa and off they went. So then when Wendy uh, came inside, she handed every one of the 150 people five note cards, just uh, index cards. It says, as you have questions, write down the questions as they occur to you and pass them over to me. And I promise you that, you know, I'm just doing this to be efficient and I'll that way make sure that we don't have a lot of duplicates. And then I will ask the questions of our speaker. And this is a tip she picked up from the League of Women Voters. In a very contentious environment, it, people have a tendency to stand up and want to give speeches that might last 50 minutes on their own. And she said, that way we don't have that happening and I promise not to skip any difficult questions, but I will maintain a level of respect and decency to everyone. And then she said, um, her introductory remarks, she says, welcome to the Darby Community Public Library. Here in America, land of the free, you're free to believe anything you please. No one can tell you what you must believe. Here in America, home of the brave, we're not afraid of new ideas. And out here in the West, we believe in Western hospitality. So please join me in welcoming our speaker. And what I love about that is she did this large frame, an expectation of shared values. She, she served as the adult in the room, treating everyone with respect and calling out the thing that this idea that we will not be afraid to listen to each other and to question each other. So the doctor of Islamic languages or Arabic languages got up and spoke for about an hour. He ran long, he went from seven to almost 9.30. Questions finally ran out and they did not dodge difficult questions when somebody said, well, doesn't it say in the Quran that, you know, Muslims shall kill the infidel? And he said, no, it says you shall kill the infidel invader. We have the right to protect ourselves from invasion, surely. So she didn't dodge any of these difficult questions. And when they got all the way to the end, Wendy said, okay, it sounds like we're in good shape. I have a round of applause for our, our speaker. And she got the round of applause. And he said, may I ask for a round of applause for your librarian who enabled us to have this wonderful, rich, fascinating conversation. And she got a standing ovation. The next day, the newspaper and they had come to the session and i think they had come expecting that the headline would be riot breaks out at community library um, instead the headline was meaningful conversation because the reporter went around and said what did you think of tonight and what they heard over and over again was that we have such a thirst for meaningful conversation we've heard about these things we didn't have a way to know about it but now here was a way for us to come be exposed to something in a very civil and civic manner and ask deep questions and really begin to understand things. I would submit that just as libraries frequently have stories of transformation for individuals, we have the capacity, we have the ability to transform our communities to make them more welcoming, more informed, and less polarized. 
the other thing that we've learned about this whole process about the notion of taking the liberated staff labor to reach out and have conversations with the community is just how deep that gratitude for contact would be. Even the movers and shakers that you would think are still working from home, still being in touch with people. They would say, huh, the library is the only public institution that called me to say, what do I think about what's going on in our community right now? There is a deep and abiding um, demonstration of value that comes down simply to please tell me what you care about. Let's talk about it. And then again, that notion of identifying shared concerns. The media often plays up, you know, it's just kind of you learn this in journalism school. You have to get both sides of the story. Well, it's very rare that the world is binary. It's a continuum. And we tend to cluster somewhere around the middle. And this notion of shared concerns, of that convergence of the things that we care about and talk about, is something that you only develop through repeated, iterated conversations. And again, the, the focus of this, is what we're trying to reach by the end, is a shared community agenda. I believe that what happens here at a time when we desperately need to rekindle trust in our institutions and each other, is for someone to stand up and be that example. Right now, as I've mentioned, the library walks into the sphere of a very contentious time with some trust. We don't play favorites. We provide information for everybody. We can be the ones that serve as leaders. And this notion about us stepping up to a type of leadership is that we can not only step up at the challenge of civic engagement during the we can also use this crisis as an opportunity to grow our knowledge of the environment and reframe public perception of and support for the library. We can build or strengthen relationships, help our community clarify its issues, and team up to deliver shared outcomes. So, thank you. With that, I wanted to leave about 15 minutes or so for questions. And uh, let me see if I can find a way now to uh, Stop sharing the screen. Uh, there it is. I'll come back so you can see my beleaguered face. And I want to call out now to Matthew. Um, Matthew. Sorry, let me jump back around here. What questions, if any, have we received here? And I would encourage all of you, as you look over on your uh, GoToWebinar control panel, there is a spot there for questions. And feel free to type anything in, and I would be happy to try to address those. Hi, Jamie. It's Carly, the moderator. I, we do have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, the one that came in says, we offer some great programs in collaboration with the Arizona Humanities called Frank Talks. Questions about Arizona Humanities Frank Talks can be directed to Donna. Oh. Great visual virtual discussion on topics of concern. So Donna was just providing information there. Um, I can provide her email. Uh, we did get another question. How did you end up in librarianship? How did your career get to there? Oh, I think it is, I, I can point very directly to uh, two or three moments. One of them was the very first time I walked into a bookmobile, there was Mrs. Johnson who looked at me as if I was the man she'd been waiting for all of her life. And when I said, uh, you know, she said, how can I help you? Or, and I said, you know, I've been reading comic books and uh, I've been reading about the speed of light. And I said, how did they figure out that light had a speed? I just thought it was on or off. And then how did they figure out how fast it was? And Mrs. Johnson, and I didn't, you know, I had a lot of distrust of adults at that time in my life, uh, but her eyes twinkled and she said, what a fascinating question, let's find out. And I thought, these are my people. These, uh, my people are the ones that think that everybody's curiosity is something to be welcomed and encouraged. And then later on, when I was in college, um, I bombed pretty badly. I thought I wanted to be a theoretical astrophysicist, but have no mathematical ability whatsoever. <laughs> and uh, I went back kind of glumly back to my hometown, and there was Mrs. Johnson. And she said, have you thought about librarians? And uh, so that was it. That was it for me. And then I wound up actually, I lived for a while in 
Aravaca, Arizona, after I hitchhiked around the country for a couple of years. And I built uh, with a, a real estate agent there, we repurposed one of the oldest schoolhouses in Arizona into a community library. And we gathered books and we cataloged them and we did story times. And I said, this is the work that I love. So then I went back to library school. And became a librarian. That's wonderful. I think for so many of us, librarianship kind of just falls into our lap and it, and it makes so much sense when it, when it comes to us that, oh, that would be wonderful, but we don't think about it initially. So um, we did have another question. So it, they said your, your ideas cover more of an admin point of view. Um, this person was wondering what it looks like at a branch level, maybe when there isn't as much support from admin. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, some years ago, uh, in fact, also in Arizona, I brought back some of my staff and we talked about how do you advocate for this kind of idea? How do you advocate for the notion of doing deep community conversations? If your branch manager doesn't support it, or if your director doesn't support it, or if your board doesn't support it. And often what happens, of course, is that we have very traditional ideas about how we're supposed to deliver our services. I believe that the pandemic right now is a wonderful opportunity to make this case. If you want to keep your staff employed and you want to have them doing important library work, why not use their time with something that they can do from home, whether they have a computer or not, they can still make phone calls. And I think this, this notion about, you know, that you, there are all kinds of different arguments. You can do it as a staff development thing. There's an opportunity for us to be better informed about our issues. You can do it from that advocacy perspective. You can do it from a planning perspective. You can do it from, you know, we are just doing a public health check to say we want to contact as many people as possible and make sure that they feel uh, regarded. So um, advocate for greater knowledge of the community. Advocate for that, making your community stronger instead of just making the library stronger. Um, if you need help for any of these uh, discussions, um, again, we're recording all this stuff, and I wonder at some point, I suspect that that mind map with my picture on the top was a little tiny. Um, I wonder if maybe I should share the screen again before we're done here, and I'll show the full mind map so that everybody can see that whole screen. Um, take it back and talk to your supervisor. Just raise the issue at a, uh, okay, we'll do that right now. So let's show my screen. Okay. Make it as large as possible. Did that work, Carly? So do you have the, now the, the large screen with the full mind map? I yeah. As long as the attendees are in full screen, they should see it on their on their full screen okay. as well. And again, I just wanted to give you the kind of the larger thing. So make a copy of this and take it in to your next staff meeting and make it available to them and say, no, were these the issues we were dealing with? Um, what do you think about this community interview process? One of the things I like about it, even though of course I kind of make my living as a consultant with this, the wonderful thing about it is that you can probably do it by yourself. This is not an expensive process. And again, that non-English emergent literacy is something that I encourage you to reach out to Unite for Literacy, depending upon how much money you want to spend, you have access to all of that content with a little bit more money and talk to United for Literacy about that. You can get that um, some hand holding for embedding the website, the liaison and the analytics. And then um, at the bottom here, you see my email address. And if you want to just ask for some uh, advice, I'm happy to offer some of that at no charge, just to say, uh, well, you might talk to your supervisor about it this way, or if you're a supervisor and want to talk to your branch manager, or branch manager want to talk to your director, director want to talk to your board. Uh, I've got lots of arguments that I've used in the past to try to make sense of that. If you didn't mind sharing your uh, mind map, we could uh, make it available to attendees uh when we email them the link to the video as well, or I'm sure they're welcome to contact you for a copy also. Um, by all means, distribute it as, as widely as you would like, by all means. Wonderful. Well, that was all the questions we received. If anybody else has a question, now's your time to get them in. If not, we would just like to take a minute to thank Jamie so much for attending today. What a wonderful presentation, a very important topic right now. And like you said, we're in this, a uh, wonderful transition period where we we have this ability to make important changes. And I've heard so often that, you know, we don't necessarily want to go back to normal from this. We want to make sure that we make improvements during this just fluctuating time. So uh, a great presentation for all of us. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you.
All right. Thank you guys so much. We're going to go ahead and just take a short break. Uh, 10, 10, 15 minutes or so. We'll resume at 10.05 and have a presentation from the State Library. So uh, go ahead and we will see you back in just a few minutes.
All right, welcome back everyone. We now have a video presentation prepared by Holly Henley and our Arizona State Library team. Before we play the video, we would like to thank Holly, her staff and the State Library for all of their support of ASLA. Your partnership and your support is a major reason why we have had such a successful webinar series. You are more than just a contributor to the success of ASLA. Your support sustains our success. We look forward to our continued partnership and expanding our collaboration in the future.
Thank you, Holly and the staff of the State Library for that video presentation. And thank you again for all of your support. Now we have our vendor program. Today, Abby Patton will be presenting eight ways to empower lifelong reading. Abby tells us how much reading matters. And in 2020, she wants to help us foster a love of reading in our communities. She will introduce Overdrive's features that will help us reach and delight more users this year and turn them into lifelong readers. At the end of the presentation, I will send out a link to a raffle for a free prize. And Abby can go ahead and give you more details about that. Welcome, Abby. Hi, thank you so much, Carly. I think I'll flip my video on here. Um, perfect, and I'm just going to show my screen. And hopefully we are seeing my slideshow. Yes, we are. All right, perfect. Um, if you actually don't mind sending out that link uh, in the chat now so that everyone can take it when while the survey or why the presentation is going on. And then at the end of this session, I'll be able to pull it up and see who we got going on here. Absolutely. Perfect. All right. Thank you. So thank you all so much for attending my session. And thank you so much for having me as well. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I would be much more excited to actually be in Arizona. We have a foot and a half of snow up here in Cleveland, but uh, those are the cards we're dealt and we move on. Um, so uh, our presentation is eight ways to empower lifelong reading um, and how Overdrive wants to help that. I don't know if any of you guys know, but Overdrive's mission is actually to create a world enlightened by reading. And we believe that the best way to do that is through libraries and helping make those uh, resources accessible to everyone. Um, so you'll notice that some of this presentation is very practical given the times that we're living in. And some of it tends to be a little bit more optimistic and a little bit glass full and uh, Hopefully uh, next year we'll have a little bit more flexibility with some of these things we can do. Um, so just a little rundown on Overdrive. If any of you guys don't know, we are the leading digital reading platform. We offer ebooks, audiobooks, videos, and magazines digitally that you can lend out. And uh, we have the Libby app and the Overdrive uh, app, and then uh, Overdrive Marketplace, which is where you can go for all of your shopping and reporting needs. So the first way to create a world enlightened by reading and to empower reading is our feature called Public Library Connect. Public Library Connect is a way to extend your public library digital collection into the virtual classroom, which given the situation that we're in this year is more important than ever. So students that work with Overdrive Education and have our student reading app called Sora, they're able to, as you see in this corner here, add a public library through their um, through their Sora app. Sora is similar to Libby, so if you're familiar with Libby, you will recognize the interface, but it does have just a few more um, educational tools that will help children as they use it for book reports and learning to read and all of those fun things. So when they add a public library in Sora, Overdrive offers the ability for the library and the school to connect so that the student can use their student ID in lieu of a library card. Um, so we do this because we know that there are a lot of um, roadblocks that can come for students who can't maybe get themselves to the library or whose parents can't take them to the library. And so we want to make sure that the library is still a viable resource for them, especially now as maybe going into the physical library is less of an option than it was. And if they can't even get into their school physical library as well, we want to make sure that Overdrive is there providing for them as well as you. Titles are filtered at a maturity level, so when a student logs into the public library, all of the adult and mature titles in your collection will automatically be filtered out. So the reason that we think Public Library Connect is a great feature for you is because it brings new users into the library and helps boost circulation of the juvenile and YA collections, which we know can sometimes be a little difficult to get that circulation going. And then it engages the next generation of loyal library users. So we want to get them young so that they know that the library is a resource that they can continue to use as they grow and as their needs change. Um, and like I said, we do know that there are barriers that can pre that can prevent students from getting a library card or coming into the library. So we want to meet those students where they are. 
So we have had some really great success with Public Library Connect. Here are a few examples of some of the, the piloters of the program who were jumping on board at first and have now seen a lot of success. So the Cleveland Public Library and the Cleveland Metropolitan School District, um, that's one that's near and dear to my own heart as I do live in Cleveland. So it's really nice to see that relationship growing and fostering. Um, so what we have noticed is that this public library circulation has boosted those YA and JUV collections, which is really great to see all of that hard work that um, the collection development te uh, teams are putting into those collections, and it's great to see them get that return. If you have any questions about Public Library Connect, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to talk more about it and give you a more thorough walkthrough. Um, so it is free to public libraries and schools. Um, all we need is a form signed by you and saying that you will allow these students to access your collection without a, um, without a public library card so that we can use their SORA authentication to get them into the public library and use that as their library card instead. The next feature, again, I think is very uh, relevant and helpful during, given the times that we're in is our instant digital card. Um, so the instant digital card helps you acquire thousands of new research reader. It has helped libraries acquire thousands of new readers. Um, so people who don't have a library card, but again, aren't able to get into the library and they want to check titles out, Instant Digital Card gives them a quick option to be able to use their phone number to get a temporary card so they can get used to using the library collection. And then when that card expires, they actually receive a prompt that tells them to go into their local library and get that full access card and become a full-fledged library patron. So um, the process is that someone will log in and click that they don't have a library card and they'd like to get an instant digital card. They'll enter in their first name, last name, email address, and phone number. They'll receive a text message uh, with, from that phone number just to confirm that it is them. And once they confirm that it is them, they respond to that text message. Their name and number are sent to our third party service called Cognito, which then checks their name against public uh, databases to make sure that they reside in a zip code that you, your library provides to us. And if they do reside in that zip code, they're granted access to your OverDrive collection using their phone number as their, as their library card. And then if they don't, um, if we can't find any evidence of them having resided in that area, they'll receive a message saying that we could not um, authenticate their information and they need to go to their local library branch. An instant digital card will last anywhere between one year to five years. And when they are 30 days away from expiring, they'll receive a text message or an email saying that they are, have 30 days left with their instant digital card and we encourage them to go to their local library and renew. And they'll get the same message when the card actually expires. All right, so here is one of our more optimistic uh, features that OverDrive offers. Hopefully, um, in an alternate world where COVID did not happen, this would have been our route in 2020. Uh, so in a parallel universe, our, our delightful digital bookmobile staff is having this wonderful trip around the country. Um, but so hopefully in 2021, we'll be able to get the digital bookmobile back out on the road. And our digital bookmobile will actually visit your library or school. Um, I apologize, I have an Alexa and sometimes she thinks I'm talking to her when I'm not. Um, but so our digital bookmobile does does travel around the country and it will stop at your library or your local schools and it will set itself up shop and it'll have overdrive staff there and it will welcome patrons into the bookmobile and get them downloaded set up on libby and helping them realize the digital resources that your library offers so in 2019 we actually had 15,412 patrons visit the digital bookmobile we visited 25 states 89 libraries and hosted 102 events um, if you ever feel like looking up or trying to sign up your library, you can just go to digitalbookmobile.com and we'll be able to give you a lot more information about it. And then also you'll be able to sign up to try and get on the route for 2021 or 2022. So our next feature is one that I hope you guys are all familiar with and loving, and that is Hold Redelivery. Hold Redelivery was introduced um, early March this year. And we believe that it's going to help libraries maximize the value of your metered content. So I know I can't be the only one who's guilty of this, but um, when we had auto checkout, which has gone away now, we do no longer offer automatic checkout on holds. 
I know I'm not the only one who I had an auto checkout and I wasn't ready for the title and it ended up sitting on my shelf for three whole weeks and then it returned it and then I had to check it out again. And we realized that that was an issue as a lot more of the content available to you has switched to metered access. So that's time and checkouts that could have um, been better used going to some, the next person in line. So our developers and all their wisdom created holds redelivery which allows users to suspend a hold even after it's been made available to them. They'll get this notification here on the right, push notifications where a kind of part and, pa part and package of hold redelivery. So now you can get a notification right on your phone that your hold is available. And when you get that hold, you'll be taken to this screen and your options are to borrow a title, manage the hold, which means you can cancel it, or redeliver later. If you hit redeliver later, you kind of become what we call frozen and the hold is suspended. So you may retain your spot and number one in line, but the title will go to the next patron on hold. Then they'll receive the option to borrow or redeliver later. When you hit redeliver later, you'll actually be given a sliding scale, which says, how long do you wanna be suspended for this hold? I usually set it to seven days and that's the default. So after those seven days are up, I become unfrozen or unsuspended and I'll receive the notification when the next title is available. So it might be three weeks, it might be one day. After I, after I unsuspend it, it just depends on how many titles are in circulation and how they're being uh, used by the other patrons. And so once, I, once the hold becomes available again, um, I'll get another notification and these will automatically, these will be my options again. You can redeliver a hold as many times as you'd like. And then if you missed your first notification, you have three days to take, to take action on the title. If it's been three days and you've taken no action, the patron will receive a one-time uh, suspension. So they will be suspended, the hold will be re-delivered. After a week, it automatically defaults to one week. They'll be made available again, their hold will be unsuspended and they'll receive uh, their notification when the next available copy comes to them. At that point, they will need to take an action on the title, either borrow, cancel, or re-deliver. If they don't take action on that secondary, um, on that secondary one, the hold will be canceled for them. They'll receive a notification that their hold was canceled and they will have to start from the bottom. We have received a lot of great feedback from patrons on this and we think it has led to increased patron satisfaction as well as making access to book more efficient for both the library and other users. So what we also do is we offer a lot of tools to acquire and delight more readers. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, magazines are one of our newer formats that we offer. Um, they're available as simultaneous use and the same platform as your eBooks and audiobooks. So it's all one stop. You can go to Libby and you can access your eBooks, your audiobooks, and your magazines all at once and read them all on the same app. Um, What's nice about our magazines is that they are uncapped simultaneous use. So patrons are never told, oh, you have to wait for this magazine or, oh, your library ran out of these of issues of this magazine, you'll have to wait until next month. So that's something that we found that's really nice is taking advantage of that simultaneous use. Another fun fact about our magazines is that they don't count toward a patron checkout limit. So if I am making, six different recipes for Christmas because my husband and I are staying home alone and I have to suddenly imitate my mother in one year or less and I check out 20 copies of Food Network, I can still check out my full amount of ebooks and audiobooks as well, as well as checking out as many magazines as I'd like. So in addition to our simultaneous use titles and our magazines, we also offer cost per circ lending model, which is when you can add a collection to, or when you can add a title to your collection at no cost, and you're only charged every time that title circulates. So if we add um, Becoming by Michelle Obama as a cost per circ title, and nobody checks it out, then you're not charged for anything. If two people check it out, you're only charged for those two checkouts. You can set a monthly CPC budget so that you never exceed um, X amount, whatever you've set. Once that limit has been set, patrons will be asked to place hold, place holds on the title. But what's nice about cost per circ is that as long as there is money in your budget, you, um, you will be able to have uh, simultaneous use access to those titles so concurrent users can check out the titles at the same time. Um, I really do enjoy cost per circ. I think it's a great way to help um, mitigate holds. 
Um, and we do have a lot of great offerings. So HarperCollins, Blackstone, Tantor, Sourcebooks, uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, and then also Penguin Random House all try and make a lot of their titles available in either the cost per circ lending model or the simultaneous use lending model. Um, so something else that we offer is our Overdrive Big Library Read titles. So three times a year, we do offer a digital book club which offers two weeks of simul free simultaneous use access to our titles that we picked. We just finished up this year, um, all three of them. I forget the most recent one, but I remember The Darwin Affair was our summer big library read, which was a historical fiction title and people really seem to enjoy it. Um, and we really like being able to offer that. Not only does it offer a sense of community where it feels like everyone's reading the same book together, but it also is just really nice for patrons to be able to come up and see an available title the first thing that when they log on to their site. Um, so something else that we offer is we help you set up digital book clubs. So we work with the publishers to get a favorable lending model and price for you for a short term simultaneous use um, book club. So if you have a title that is not available currently as simultaneous use or cost per circ, but you're going to have a virtual author meeting where they're going to come and discuss at the book club and you'd really like for your patrons to be able to access that title and all have it checked out for that library talk, I encourage you to reach out to me and we can work with the publisher and try and get some favorable terms for you so we can give them simultaneous use access to that title for a short period of time. So um, something else that we use to empower reading is our lucky day feature. So a lot of a lot of collections have this in their physical one. So Sizzler's Lucky Day, um, Too Hot to Handle, or sorry, Too Hot to Hold, sorry, Too Hot to Handle is one of our curated collections that always pops up. Um, but so Too Hot to Hold. So we found that these increase circulation and satisfaction. So just like I said on the previous slide where patrons love to come to a site and see a title that's available right away that they can grab, Lucky Day helps do that with the most popular titles of the day. Um, so, when you add a title as a lucky day, you basically say this title right here, this copy of this title is not going to have any holds placed on it. And by doing that, you're ensuring that it's always in circulation and that if I come to a site and the title is available in a lucky day, I can snap it up. Even if there is a really long holds list for that title, I can still check it out and feel count myself very lucky that I was able to skip that holds line. Some of the features about Lucky Day is there are no renewals on Lucky Day titles so that someone um, so that people have to return it and then someone else can try and stumble upon it for a Lucky Day. Um, so we think that this is great for high demand digital titles because if someone comes to the site and uh, so ask again, yes, I actually just won a Goodreads award, I think, and it was really, really popular in the spring. And if someone heard about it and they were so excited and they go to the library and they see, oh my gosh, I have to wait like three months to get Ask Again Yes. And then they come back to the site the next day to look for something else and they see it's available and they're able to check it out. That's going to encourage them to continue to come back to the site and continue to utilize uh, this resource for themselves. And so that's kind of what we're going to do. We're trying to keep those patrons coming back. They are always available on a first come first serve basis. So if you come in and it's available, you can have it. Otherwise you need to place a hold on the other line. So then when, if you do place a, if you do have a hold on this title and you check it out in Lucky Day, um, we have two options. And if the default lending period for the Lucky Day lending title, which you can edit to make it one week, two week, or three weeks, if it matches your default lending period, then it will automatically cancel the hold that the patron has on that title when they check it out in Lucky Day. And that way they're still getting the title, but in case they forget to remove their hold, this way they get their hold back so they can place it on another title. And your hold list does shorten and give hope to those patrons who haven't been able to find the Lucky Day title. Um, it is a feature in Marketplace when you go to your admin site, I'm sorry, when you go to your curate button, there's a whole lucky day section. And if anyone has any questions or wants to utilize it or needs help setting it up, again, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always happy to help with that. Um, I do think it's a really great feature. It looks really fun on your site. We've made that curated collection pop and stand out from the standard ones. They're actually kind of crooked and sideways, which is fun, um, just to try and grab that attention and draw people to the lucky day titles. 
Something else that, we're, that we found has been really effective is we pop up in the hold shelf this little you're in luck. So if I have a title on hold and it becomes available on lucky day and I'm in Libby and I go to my shelf, I'm actually going to see this title that I have a hold is on my home shelf page, just kind of glaring sign there that's saying, hey, you want this title and it's available. Um, and then you have the option to check it out or if you don't want it yet, you can just ignore it and it'll go away. So, like I said, some of this is a little bit more optimistic. So I don't know about you guys, but I have been driving a lot less in, the pa in this past year. Um, but before I did stop driving, what I really loved is that we have audiobook compatibility for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. So this means that when you plug your phone into your car, and Libby is actually going to pop up on the home screen and make it easier and safer for drivers to navigate their audiobooks when they're in their car, as opposed to needing to pull up their phone and try and toggle it from there, because we all know that's very dangerous. Um, so it offers a lot of those features that you love in Libby, such as skipping ahead and skipping back. You see those 15 forward, 15 back, um, and then the pause. So those are all the main functions that we feel that people are using. Audiobook speed is also available on there, so people can edit that on that home screen as well. Um, and then obviously pausing if you need to pause. Uh, sometimes when I'm riding in the car with someone uh, and they just won't stop talking, uh, I can pause it and then I can rewind it without ever looking at my phone. And an extra fun fact is that Libby is now integrated with Sonos speakers, so patrons can enjoy the audiobooks without headphones or Bluetooth. It will just automatically, you can set up your Libby within the Sonos speaker. And Sonos speakers also don't start talking very loudly when you're giving a presentation like uh, that one over there does. Um, so the last thing that I want to talk to you guys about is um, probably my favorite thing about working at Overdrive, and it's marketplace insights and data. So I am a bit of a data nerd, and I love that we have all of these resources just all in one place in Marketplace so that you can see what, how your collection is doing, what your patrons are doing within your collection, and what's doing well. So um, we have a lot of data reports and insights. So my favorite is probably the checkouts report. And there's so many different ways you can toggle through it. So if you're interested in just seeing your ebook checkouts, if you're interested in just seeing your audiobook checkouts, that's something that you can do within Marketplace and really get that breakdown. You can see which subjects are circulating best by organizing it to sort by your sub by your subjects. And I again, I just really love it. Um, we try and make it as easy as possible to see when we have big sales going so that you're able to shop those campaigns and sales and get those dramatic savings. Um, so right now we're actually in the middle of our uh, end of year sale, formerly known as our holiday sale. Um, you can get a lot of great titles for up to 50% off this year. Um, I definitely encourage people to take advantage of that. Um, I love the holiday, uh, sorry, end of year sale. Um, just because I just really love to shop in December, so it makes me very happy. Something else that Overdrive's offer is our customized tools and our automated carts. So a lot of times we found that people don't have time to go through and continually try and manage those holds manually. So we've created a um, so we've created a cart that will automatically Pull, go through all of the titles in your collection and pull anything that hits above a certain hold ratio and put it in a cart for you that you can then peruse and say, no, I don't want to buy this one or yes, I'd like to purchase this one and just create that cart for you to save you some time and some digging through the collection. So Marketplace is a really great tool to be able to go in and you can also curate your collection. So you can choose what your patrons first see when they go to your Overdrive site. If you have um, a certain holiday that's coming up, if you have, again have an author visit, you can create all of these, you can, you can highlight all of those titles on the homepage and you do that through Marketplace by going to the admin tool. Um, alrighty, what is next? So here is a checklist for you. Um, so Public Library Connect, uh, that again, I'm just gonna probably go through everything we went through. I know I talk very fast, so I wanna make sure that um, I've highlighted everything. So Public Library Connect is the ability for your local school and your local library to work together to try and give as much access to the students in your area as possible to their library in a time where they maybe can't come into the library. 
Um, so if you want to opt into that, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. We have a form that's pretty easy to sign and then you send back. Um, instant digital card or um, what you'll notice about, about Overdrive is that we really like to call three call things by three words and then just shorten them to um, initials. So PLC is our Public Library Connect, IDC is our instant digital card. So adding instant digital card to your library and trying to draw in those new users who are attempting to, I don't know, entertain themselves while they're stuck at home or find better ways to enrich themselves, maybe listen to some uh, self-improvement titles on audiobook, those are big. So we want to be able to offer those resources to them while they strike while the iron's hot and make sure that we get them into the library and realize that it's such a valuable resource and create a lifelong patron. Um, you can attempt to schedule a digital bookmobile event or just learn more about it. Again, that's digitalbookmobile.com. Um, prepare your staff for hold read delivery. Um, hopefully everyone is pretty prepared for it at this point. It's been going for a while. Um, but if you ever have any questions about it or any issues that pop up, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I definitely encourage you to check out our magazines, our cost per serve titles, and looking further into digital book clubs. Additionally, something that uh, one of my favorite publishers, mostly because they publish Marie Benedict, who's got a new book coming out soon, very excited, historical fiction nerd over here. Um, so that was a tangent, I apologize. But so one of my favorite publishers, Sourcebooks, has actually recently started offering one month simultaneous, one month, one title simultaneous use. Um, packages, even though it's only one title. And so by doing this, they've made their, almost their entire offerings are also available as simultaneous use for a month. So if you wanted to celebrate the fact that the new Marie Benedict is coming out, you could get one of her older titles um, and get it for simultaneous use and say, prepare for the mystery of Mrs. Christie, I think is what it's called, by reading um, one of Marie Benedict's other popular titles, uh, Lady Clementine and putting it up on your site and everyone would be able to check it out all at once. So that is a feature that we that we are happy to now be offering where we can offer that short term simultaneous use without having to jump through all the hoops of organizing an overdrive book club because you can do it yourself in marketplace. Um, lastly, I, sorry, not lastly, we're still going. Um, curating a lucky day collection in Marketplace. So delineating those titles that are always go, that are when they show up are going to be available, no holds placed on them, and then putting them up front and center of your site so someone can jump on and grab it. So first thing they see when they get to the library. Um, I definitely encourage you to set up that feature. Um, it's pretty easy to do once you get the hang of it. You're just designating titles and then you can set up an automated curated collection so that anything that's lucky day and anything that's available will automatically be showing up in those results and it will be one of the first things that patrons see when they go on their site. If you choose not to curate a collection for lucky day, it will still be available. And as a lucky day collection, it'll just be harder to find. So if you're into scavenger hunts, that's definitely something you could do. And then it will also pop up in the Libby shelf. Um, just if you're going to the grocery store or if you guys are doing curbside, so you're driving into the library, I would definitely encourage you to try setting up uh, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto with Libby just to get that experience and see that it is actually very nice and it's something that if a patron comes in because they got a new car that doesn't have a CD player and they're devastated and they don't know what to do, how are they going to listen to their audiobooks? Enter Libby. Libby can help them do it all from their car, their new fancy car that does not have a CD player. Um, mine does not, and I'm kind of bitter about it because that's where all my Christmas CDs were. But um, like I said, we deal with the cars that were handled. Foot and a half of snow, no CD player. It's, it's rough up here in Cleveland. And then uh, lastly, just make sure that you go and check out Marketplace and you see all the features, use all those reports. Um, it's really fun. Or also sometimes if I am in Marketplace, I will admit I will sometimes go down the rabbit hole and start kind of going through all those popular titles and really increase that to be read pile that I have. So I'm often toggling between Marketplace and Libby to try and get those uh, new titles as quickly as I can. Um, so one other thing that I do want to show off to you as Christmas is coming up, show off your Libby love with t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, and more. Um, actually, I'm going to show you guys what I was wearing today. 
So they're pretty cool. I really like them. I actually just bought a bunch for my family. They're really fun. Um, so all profit profits from purchases of Libby swag will be donated to liter literacy campaigns around the world. So it's kind of a double gift. You can give someone something for Libby and then you can also tell them that they're don that you've donated to a literacy campaign kind of in their name because they're the one that's getting the thing. So we do have t-shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, stickers, uh, those canvas totes that we usually give out in um, in shows, which we're not doing right now, which is sad, but those Libby canvas totes are there as well. Okay, and the winner of the t-shirt contest is, hold on, I have to sign in again. And Abby, I had sent you a message. Oh, good. Uh, Thank you. Sorry, I'm in my own little world. You're okay. So we did actually only have one person fill out the survey. <laughs> so that makes oh, I, think them they the I think that makes them the winner. So I think it does. Um, so I do apologize. I'm going to do my best to oh, I think we have we have so three now. The other, a, the other one is a panelist and did not want she just wanted information on overdrive. She did not want to be a part of the, the raffle. Okay. Wait, so did number three or six number, win? Number six. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to um, apologize if I cannot um, say your name correctly. I promise I'm trying my best. So that would be uh, Tatima Par uh, Parnprom. And you are from Sierra Vista. Yay, thank you so much for attending. And then thank you as well for um, registering. So our marketing team will be reaching out to you um, with the email that you've put in here. Um, to try and get you set up. So we'll get your address and we'll get your t-shirt size all squared away. Um, so last, this is uh, my last slide. Uh, I encourage you to stay connected with Overdrive and stay connected with our news. So we have blogs.overdrive.com that will help you kind of stay updated on all of the good things that we're doing here at Overdrive, all of our updates coming. So I do encourage you to sign up for our blog. You can follow us at on Twitter at Overdrive, Overdrive Libs and Libby app, Overdrive for Libraries on Facebook, and at Overdrive underscore Libs on Instagram. Um, the person who is in charge of our social media accounts, Ricky, just got a beautiful little white dog and she is very tiny and very, very fluffy. And she has been making appearances on a lot of the Instagram accounts posts lately. So if you are in the need for books and puppies, that Instagram account is the way to go. Um, did we have any questions that came through on the chat? Sorry, I'm looking through them now. Okay, we didn't have any questions. Um, if, if anybody has any questions right now, if they'd like to submit uh, for Abby before we go. Let's see. Just making sure. Well, thank you so much, Abby, for that presentation. Um, I personally use Overdrive through my public library. We don't have it here at my academic library, but some really great things uh, that you guys offer. So thank you so much for presenting today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can swap the control back to you, I think, or do you take it away? There we go. Oh, perfect. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, my contact information is A-P-A-T-T-O-N at overdrive.com. So that's apatton at overdrive.com. So if you have any issues or questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And I will go ahead and put that uh, email address in the chat box for everyone to see. And we will, uh, I believe we're gonna make slides available or information available to everybody who has attended today as well. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you all so much and I hope you have a great week and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you thank so you much for having me. Absolutely, you as well. Bye. All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get right into our program after that. Uh, so today we will have Alexander Soto. Uh, present, we are still here. 
no, I apologize. Wrong right, script. So we're going to have Alexander Soto present. Alexander is an operations supervisor at ASU's Laboria National American Indian Data Center. Alexander's presentation today is titled, let me get back to it, More Than a Checklist, Meaningful Indigenous Inclusion in Arizona Libraries. Uh, so welcome so much, Alex, for, uh, for uh, and thank you for presenting today. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Check. check. Yes. Two. Yes. All right. Give me a, a moment to share my screen. I remember correctly. Uh, can y'all see that? Yes, we can. Right. Cool. So, what was that? Uh, your sound was in and out a little bit. So, uh, I'll, I'll know. Know. yes, we can. Okay. So, I guess uh, one second to bring something up on my end. Um, good morning, everybody. As you know, in the virtual world, it's always crazy the transition to these uh, <laughs> beginnings of a presentation. So, I apologize. All right. Um, Skuk Sirik, Anyan Apshugi, Alex Soto, Anyan Amjik, Wawasik, Thonawatham Amjik. Greetings. Uh, my name is Alex Soto. I'm originally from the Thonawatham Nation from the community of Cells. And today, um, in this capacity, or I'll, I'll be in multiple capacities, but uh, the first hat I'm wearing is yes, I am the operations supervisor at the Labrio National American Indian Data Center, um, which is part of Arizona State University Library. It's a unit within the library that um, specializes in um, indigenous library services for our students and community. Um, we also have the, or oversee the majority of the collection involving, revolving around native communities, native knowledge. And uh, my second hat I'm wearing, I'm also a graduate student at the University of Arizona. I am, uh, well, I will be uh, graduating next week. So I have less than a couple, couple days here to be done with the degree. Um, but yeah, I've been in the program since uh, last year. I'm also part of the, the Knowledge River program, which most of y'all are probably familiar with, but it's a program within the high school that specializes in uh, initially Latino and Native American librarianship, and now it's expanded to include uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color librarianship and allies to those communities. And my last hat I'm wearing is that, as mentioned, I'm Thon Anthem. So as a community member of the Thon Anthem Nation, um, you know, I definitely gain a lot of experience and insight on the importance of, of libraries and um, how that can be very crucial um, for us, especially those of us living in town uh, in urban areas or off reservations. And I wanted to note that this presentation is more focused towards um, just the non-Indigenous libraries because tribal libraries are in itself their own, own entity. They have other, um, other areas of focus. And uh, myself as someone who's lived off the res for a great majority of my life, I just wanted to know uh, my experiences and you know what I've seen in, um, in libraries and why I'm here today and why I'm going to you know finish my MLIS and why it's important for Native communities. And so, um, as mentioned, you know my community is um, on the border area of Arizona, and I'll get into uh, the exacts in a moment. But as all of them, you know, we're just not that's just not where we're from. We're also throughout um, Central and South Southern Arizona. And so up here in Phoenix, where I currently live, it's also Autumn territory. So at this point, I wanted to transition to one of my uh, student workers who will introduce herself in a moment, who will be reading um, uh, the ASU Library Land Acknowledgement Statement, just so we can start off in a good way. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, to note that um, she'll be presenting somewhere about halfway in. And so Lourdes, if you want to switch the mic on, read the statement. Can everyone hear me okay? Or can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, 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 good morning, everyone. My name is Lourdes Pereira. I'm here at Chiratham in UMA. I come from the San Lucie District of Donaldson Nation. I am a sophomore here at, a, um, at, at ASU, and I'm double majoring in Justice Studies and American Indian Studies, and I'm also this year's uh, Miss Indigenous ASU. 
So it's an honor to be here with everyone today and um, uh, I'll just continue with the land statement or the land acknowledgement. I don't know, yeah. <clears throat> The ASU Library acknowledges the 22 Native nations that have inhabited this land for centuries. Arizona State University's four campuses are located in the Salt River Valley on ancestral territories of Indigenous peoples, including the Akadamu Otham and Peeposh Indian communities, whose care, whose care and keeping of, of these lands allows us to be here today. ASU li ASU's libraries acknowledges the sovereignty of these nations and seeks to foster an, an environment of success and possibility for Native American students and patrons. We are advocates for the incorporation for the incorporation of indigenous knowledge system and research methodologies within contemporary library practices. ASU Library welcomes members of the Akamalatham and Peeposh and all Native nations to the library. Sapo, thank you. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Lourdes, for reading. And as mentioned, she's one of our awesome student archivists, student um, workers here at the Labriola Center, and she'll be sharing a bit about her story um, and the role impact the libraries have played thus far in her very uh, her early uh, academic career, the start of a long academic career. And so um, going into the purpose of this presentation, uh, due to the lack of indigenous information professionals in the li library and archives profession, this presentation provides an overview of the impacts that Indigenous librarians can have in non-Indigenous memory institutions like libraries and archives. Uh, this is done by stressing the importance of Indigenous librarianship, which values the intellectual, cultural, and spiritual needs of Indigenous patrons in the wider, wider way of uh, library programming and services. Since Indigenous values differ among tribal nations and are unfortunately impacted by settler colonialism, there is no one-size-fits-all approach for providing library services to indigenous populations or working to recruit and retain indigenous library staff. So this presentation seeks to highlight um, that meaningful indigenous inclusion must be more than the checklist and become more ingrained in the profession and uh, non-native institutions. Um, and I mentioned indigenous librarianship, just a quick definition of that. It's a broad field of practice and scholarship that unites indigenous knowledge systems with the discipline of library information science, so LIS, and indigenous librarianship challenges the library community to take a fresh look at ways materials by or about indigenous people are organized, classified, and represented to library users. It acknowledges the critical role of indigenous cultural principles and the distinctiveness and value of indigenous knowledge systems. So that being said, indigenous librarianship varies per, uh, we'll say application of it, per um, individual, per nation, per area they're located in, you know, so like my definition of it will look different in someone who lives uh, back east or, you know, so-called Canada and First Nations territories. Um, so yeah, it just really depends. So that being said, uh, what I would like to share today is what it means to me at first to understand um, what to me is meaningful based on who I am and where I'm from. And so this photo here is a, a photo um, that was actually the last event we were able to have before COVID hit and it's at the Labriola Center's West Campus location. And so I share this photo to show that this is why I'm here, you know, why I'm doing what I'm doing, why I'm pursuing this area, this line of work, is because to create spaces for Native students and our Native community members here in the Phoenix area and, and, and across the state, as far as, you know, connecting how libraries can support um, the needs, you know, with our students and, you know, the needs of our community. And so this event was an open mic, open house event and I wanted to start off just to show, you know, like this is, um, you know, what happens or what, what I, you know, felt very proud that day to, which I'll get into how this day came to be, you know, but just to show that, wow, there's a library that has natives in it and it's full of happy faces right around an open mic, open house event full of native artists and poets and being able to uh, address critical areas of, of, you know, topics and discussions and areas that students wanted to hear and community wanted to hear. And so to me, that's just like first, I guess, my um, intentions, right, of joining this type of work and providing relevant and needed support. And so I guess I wanted to show that to show like, for me, this is what librarianship means, you know, like everything, every, um, I guess how I approach this is very meaningful for my community. And so it really starts with these core areas here, which I think um, generally speaking, I think as librarians, 
an archivist, we all want to provide, you know, reference services, right, to our, our community to help inform them with information literacy. Uh, we want to provide programming, you know, um, that's definitely going to be impactful and, um, you know, draw, draw a crowd, right, and be able to um, show and share um, library um, resources. And we also want to have books, right, that speak to our community members and out of that build that partnership and trust. And so with me, it's a different layer to that because in addition to, um, you know, focusing on just what I just shared about the general, I guess, uh, pillars of the profession, it also has to be indigenized in a way that speaks to uh, my users in that sense of the Labriola Center, uh, you know, indigenous patrons. And so like to me, it has a cultural element to it. So it's a culturally appropriate, you know, view of reference services because in that sense, it's more coming from a place of that I can connect with that the student or a community member when they're trying to find information and me being native, them being native, you know, we have that understanding of certain topics and the nuance of certain things they're researching. So especially at ASU with like a lot of the literature may or may not be from natives, um, it's just having that critical eye and understanding um, the impacts of colonialism has had on academia and be able to sort through that to help provide those resources. And it's always good to have it coming from someone who may look like them or has a similar background and can understand um, their purpose, you know, wh why they're looking for it, you know, because a lot of times this research is before their communities to help address social ills and this dynamics that as, and as natives in Indian country we've been experiencing. So this that area, just as a, a librarian in that sense, you know, like I have to like kind of use that lens and also the same thing with programming, identifying those type of programs that speak and empower um, our community to be able to understand, um, able to be empowered to want to um, use libraries and be able to see that it is a tool and, you know, whatever topics, areas of interest they're into and building those relationships, which I'll show more at the end of this presentation. And of course, as far as books, just having a, a critical eye on what type of books we purchase. Um, in the Labriola Center, um, which you'll I keep saying down the road, I have a whole slide about Labriola, but more so around the importance of having an indigenous informed collection to be able to um, highlight um, native authors and to be able to um, have books that um, are able to show um, or portray, you know, some of these nuanced conversations happening now in native communities. And then for those who are books that are not published by non-natives, you know, finding books that may be important because it's critical of, you know, what's been written about natives. So it's compared to this, like any book about, you know, natives by a non-native author that may or may not fully accurately portray us in a positive light. So that's just part of what I have to do, you know, as far as having that critical eye and of course building those partnerships based on what I just shared now um, to you're able to have a relationship, whether that's here at ASU with other native um, departments and um, different um, this programs and so on, or beyond where, you know, it could be tribal communities, which uh, we've been able to do here uh, working with uh, you know various reservations throughout the state of Arizona and native uh, nonprofit organizations. So that's what librarianship means to me. So I kind of hit you with that right now. This is like that's kind of where I'm coming from when I'm sharing today. And so those impacts, of course, can relate back to what I'm sharing here in terms of like it helps reclaim space, it helps community build, and it helps uh, you know in that sense gain that trust that you have someone who looks like them in a space. And, you know, you're able to then, you know, outside of a physical space, like I said earlier, with the more of a connection, you know, as far as sharing um, or for reference services and so on, you're able to claim that intellectual space. And in some cases, you know, like those conversations lead to um, topics around um, cultural revitalization and just some of the negative impacts that colonialism has had on Native communities. So even in reference, you might, it might get emotional, right? It might get uh, a little heavy because you're you're bringing up stories, you're bringing up instances, you're bringing up moments that um, granted may not fall into the typical reference interview, but are very important to sort out what type of information they're trying to um, gather for the sake of their research or whatever their you know, inquiry is. And so um, that's a lot of you know what I've seen with my presence here at Labriola is that you know I've been able to connect with students on that level. Um, of course, with everybody, not just natives too, but even non-natives who don't know about a lot of this. And as a native um, librarian, having to like have those conversations, those nuanced talks about those impacts. And you know, for the most part, students who are doing research on native communities have been very respectful about the history of colonialism in our communities. And so with that, you know, helps build that trust, like I said. And then, you know, even then having someone like myself in these positions, you're able to um, 
you know, provide insight on these matters that I can then share to my uh, my boss, right, to administration, to folks that I have to uh, report to you about um, just things that they may or may not know because they're not from where I'm from, they're not native. And so this the fact that you have someone that's in these areas uh, or from my background in these type of spaces, non-native spaces, can go a long way. And so it is a process to get here. And I guess what I wanted to share now is that although this sounds, um, you know, of course, this is what I think a lot of us um, want, you know, is to have a library space for natives to be able to, um, you know, have a similar uh, instance like the photo in the beginning of like happy library users and, you know, you're able to, um, you know, meet their needs and so on. Um, fortunately, that's not really the case because <laughs> um, in light of how colonialism has played out in this country and how Native people, um, unfortunately, um, are not the majority in that sense. We are usually 0 .9, 0 0.9 or 1.2 or 2 point something, depending on what census reports and depending on what area you live in and so on. We're always, um, you know, definitely the, the, mar the, uh, the minority of the minority, we'll say. And so it's very hard to even have awareness of what I just shared right now. Because like I said, for me, that's, um, that's my, my day to day, right? That's what I strive for. Um, I have an indigenous lens going into work uh, and before even being here at Labriola and just my view of librarianship. And so that's just hand in hand. But from what I've gathered from um, other spaces I've been in, those are not uh, mentioned, they're acknowledged and so on. And the reason I have to kind of start in this way is to show that even as of a month ago with this image here that was um, from CNN on election night, um, as you can see, I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with this image, but it's kind of caused waves in Indian country because due to the record native turnout, um, you know, of course, everybody was a record turnout across the board, but it looks, as you can see on here, natives were not even acknowledged on this chart um, or something else, along with others, you know, other quote unquote underrepresented communities. And native country definitely um, was offended by this uh, and rightfully so is because he definitely had a massive uh, native turnout, you know, wanting to um, get involved in, in this process, the system that we have through elections. And this is uh, on a mainstream level, <laughs> deflects kind of that ignorance and lack of uh, acknowledgement and lack of uh, understanding, which is obviously very marginalizing, marginalize our communities, but it's also very dehumanizing. And so it's very hard to be able to um, get to the place where I showed in the beginning um, when the majority of the population um, views us as that, you know, as many cases, many instances in my own life, when I share that I'm native, they, they act like, um, I get responses like, well, I thought you guys were all gone, or, you know, I thought you were, um, you know, a different ethnic background and so on. I'm like, no, I'm done off. And so that really is, you know, part of the journey of being indigenous, but in terms of being in the library profession, I've always, you know, kind of been the only one in that sense, or one of two, or uh, one of five at best, you know, and so I wanted to start off with this image to show that as of a month ago, that's kind of, that's where, how we're framed. And it's very unfortunate because we have a voice, you know, I have a voice, we have a voice, you know, I have my own influences, you know, we have our influence on this country and in our own power. And so as depicted here in this map and not to get political or anything, but of course, as we all know, Arizona turned blue, which is usually not the case. And that was mainly because of native communities coming out and having a voice and being able to share, um, you know, who they are for the process, uh, you know, as far as asserting, you know, um, influence here in that sense. And so as this map shows, you know, as you can see, it's, it's kind of hand in hand with the reservation. And so that's very, uh, to me, shows that although we're not acknowledged, although we're, we're marginalized, although, you know, we're not immediately thought of, we're still here, you know, and I, I guess that's the classic um, phrase that you hear from natives. But it was just really, really unfortunate that, you know, CNN put that out. Um, it had a huge buzz on native Twitter and so on. Of course, a lot of memes came out of it that, you know, oh, we're something else, right? You know, if you have American Indian studies degree, I have a something else studies degree and so on. Jokes like that were cracked because as natives, we tend to tend to laugh and roll with it with that resilience that we have with humor. But regardless of that, you know, this is kind of what I see in terms of libraries then is that, you know, that's usually my experience, you know, like folks that I've worked with colleagues um, really in the beginning stages of my um, paraprofessional career, not even knowing that and not knowing that they're very close to native reservations, depending on what uh, public library you're in here in Phoenix. But 
yeah, it was very, like I said, uh, very, it wasn't, it wasn't good to see when I saw that something else mean. But that being said, um, you know, like I said, there's these barriers that we need to address and encounter. And it really comes down to there's no acknowledgement, right, of indigenous people. A lot of times it's not on in the mainstream uh, consciousness. And it's partly mainly because of settler privilege. And for those who are unfamiliar with that, um, to be completely honest, you know, with settler privilege, um, you know, everybody is a settler in the Americas, you know, if you're not native. And even to take it further, you know, as native people, like if I was to go to um, Flagstaff or, you know, Northern Arizona, although I'm native, you know, I'm an indigenous person down here from, uh, you know, Southern Arizona, I would be a settler on Hopi and Navajo land. So just, you know, that awareness of knowing whose land you're on and knowing, um, you know, how it relates to, um, you know, your day to day is very important. And I think with this discussion around equity, um, inclusiveness, diversity, and so on, um, this is something, you know, I think non-natives need to be aware of is that they have settler privilege and it's very convenient to um, forget about us, right? Um, and hence we have that meme I, or the image I showed a couple slides ago. And so that can have a devastating impact in terms of this, the consciousness of um, who we are, you know, our impacts of who we are as natives, because if we're not acknowledged and if folks can't see that they have that settler privilege, then yeah, we're gonna have a lack of staff. Yeah, we're going to have a lack of space, you know, in libraries, and that's, you know, kind of what I've seen thus far. Um, although, uh, which I'll share some of the positive things I've experienced, it always comes down to that: is that people just don't know, and that's why I'm here today to share what I'm sharing. And it leads to, yeah, lack of space. So, how can we even, um, you know, have a space and staff when there's no acknowledgement, right, or no understanding that it's even important, or understanding that, hey, if I have a public library that's near a rural native community and I have a lot of users that are coming to use the computer due or I, you know, the computers due to the lack of internet in that community. Maybe we should find ways to partner. Maybe we should find ways to um, you know really in a meaningful way develop policies and services that help um, provide support. And a lot of times, you know, from my experiences or what I've known from colleagues and friends, that's often overlooked. You know, it's like a, it's a radical idea I mean, sometimes to even propose these things. And it just makes sense that if you're by a huge population, right, you should be able to, um, to support them and even better have someone that looks like them, right, which leads to a whole issue of hiring and retention. And so, yeah, these things are definitely compounded and uh, you know, it all goes back to this uh, lack of cultural competency, which tends to be, um, you know, the main phrase that we use in the profession here around us not knowing others and having empathy and, you know, acknowledgement of these issues. But to me, I'll take it even further to note that this is no understanding the tribal, tribal critical race theory. And for those who are not familiar with this, it's definitely, uh, it's a uh, build on critical race theory, which has been around since the 1960s and 70s, but it's through the indigenous lens to show that outside of the inequities and some of the systematic things that need to be addressed um, for native people in this country, and also takes on a whole other level because as native people, you know, we have a spiritual and cultural connection to the lands that we're on and spiritual cultural connection to the knowledge we're trying to access. So the tribal critical race theory, it really puts that in perspective by noting how the importance to understand um, that native people just have a unique way of accessing um, knowledge, right? The concepts of culture, knowledge, and power take on a new meaning when examined from an indigenous lens. And I think uh, whether that's libraries or any other profession, um, folks need to understand that for natives, along with just navigating the rat race of modern society, we also need to understand um, that we have to indigenize or incorporate it to make sense in our own worldviews. And so it's very difficult to do that when you're also um, giving your emotional labor to validate who you are in those spaces to say, hey, I'm still here. And, you know, whatever, uh, you know, grievances that are being addressed um, need to be addressed for one. Um, but also, too, like if we really want to be meaningful, we need to start looking at it from that lens. And so that that's always been a it's been a challenge to share. And I'll share in a moment, you know, how that how that's been playing out with the ASU library system, which has been positive so far. And um, but yeah, it definitely is, is a unique journey in that sense. So that being said, I want to transition since there's really um, no clear solutions that I'm stating, or a lot of this is a kind of surface level one-on-one -on -one issues that I'm mentioning, and diversity only goes, or diversity trainings only go so far and have no impact sometimes. 
Uh, I just want to share, you know, I guess a case study in that sense of, of my journey to get here and how maybe there might be things you can pull from uh, along with Lourdes' journey that can maybe help you understand and highlight um, areas that your organization can um, help to foster, you know, um, I guess a better uh, approach or kind of have a better understanding about why we don't have a lot of, or why we don't have native librarians, uh, you know, in our organizations. And so with myself, uh, as mentioned, I've been in libraries for quite some time. I've actually worked uh, initially in public libraries at Phoenix Public Library as of 2006. I was a circulation attendant part-time. And um, at the time, of course, it was just a job. I didn't think I would be sitting here today or finishing up my degree. But um, yeah, I worked at the Cesar Chavez branch, which is located in the Levine area, which borders the Hilly River Indian community. And it was, uh, you know, quite the experience for me, just the one being libraries, as we all experience at first, it's an awesome feeling, you know, just to be a uh, staff and just to be, be behind the scenes after, you know, checking out books as a patron for years and now working for a library. So it was a very positive experience, but it really set the seeds for what I'm uh, doing now. And I'm sharing this because, you know, like I said, this journey, my journey may lend clues and directions on how to address these issues. But along the way, I've definitely been helped and empowered by non-native staff and native staff that's helped me be more assertive in what I'm doing and why I'm even presenting today. But in addition to that, eventually yeah, I got to ASU, which I'm currently at now, and then as uh, finishing up my undergraduate degree and now my graduate degree at U of A, I've also interned in tribal libraries or helped in tribal libraries. So I think I have a kind of a broad scope of you know who I am or um, of, of some of the needs for natives from both a non-tribal perspective and also uh, our non-tribal reservation perspective in an urban setting. And so with myself, uh, or real quick, that last photo was from like 12 years ago. So young guy back then. So fast forward here, or rewind even more to, to 2007. Um, it's my first exposure, like I said, uh, frontline work, just working at a circulation desk. And it was always difficult at times to um, you know, kind of have this conversation right now that I'm talking about. And it was first evident in um, you know, just issuing library cards. And you know, uh, at the time, a lot of Hilly River Indian community members were happy to have a library right nearby, so they would come into to the library system, uh, Phoenix. And um, yeah, there has some confusion kind of time around tribal IDs. And ultimately, uh, that was you know, made policy within the Phoenix Public Library system. Um, but around the time I got on board, it was still an issue because it was just an issue around um, I guess, you know, finalizing things, but, you know, even on a staff level, the sharing that tribal IDs are government issued IDs, because for a while I would have to get into uh, in, uh, dialogues with my, my coworkers about how it is a valid ID, because it's a government issued ID, and then them not knowing, what, you know, what I meant by that, and here I am, a 20, 21 year old kid, explaining tribal sovereignty to older uh, staff members who are non-native, and just kind of going through those motions and making sure that they were, um, you know, providing customer service to those folks that came in with those cards. Um, I will say from what I understand, the reason it was mainly changed um, was because of another native person that was in those meetings uh, and circulation policies that advocate that, yeah, tribal IDs are, tribal, are also government issued IDs. So I just want to share that to show that even back then I've had to um, add my two cents on these type of topics, but also to show that those things are pretty basic for us as natives to understand and know but apparently it's um, people just don't know that. And so that leads to cultural competency. And so with the, on that note, this photo here, and you're probably wondering why it's, you know, a microphone and all this equipment is that while I was, you know, outside of doing my circulation duties, I also was able to, uh, you know, embed more of, uh, or learn more about uh, libraries and, and programming. And so as a, before library line, I used to be a rapper, musician, uh, community activist, you would say, so I was able to insert some of that uh, through library services for Phoenix. And that was a really awesome moment because it helped me see the importance of, um, you know, how you can present uh, information in a non-traditional format. So like this photo here is just me, of do, me doing beat, a, a beat making workshop for a youth because that was something we used to do um, with my hip hop group. And so out of it, I started to see like, well, you can, you know, do more with libraries than just, um, you know, be at the front desk, right? Or, you know, refer someone a book and so on. And so that really opened my eyes into like want to know more about librarianship, but just say between 2009 and seven or 17, I uh, was doing music, traveled uh, 
throughout the country, Canada, Germany, Europe, on tour. Uh, I didn't think I would be here today. And then eventually in 2017, I got back into school at HU. And so at that time, I got exposure to um, the BIPOC librarianship. And it's mainly with the knowledge of a program. It was something that I've always heard about, even, even when I was at Phoenix. And um, it was really good, uh, you know, like I said, various uh, non-Native colleagues, coworkers would always encourage me due to my passion with music, passion for my community. I just didn't have my degree. So by 2017, 2018, um, definitely was uh, about to finish up my bachelor's. And within that, I got exposed um, to what I'll share in a moment. And then that led to my exposure to community-driven archives in the Circle Back to the Library Old Center. So with Knowledge River, I'm sure most of y'all are familiar with Knowledge River, but um, it's definitely been a lifeline for me to have that support from BIPOC um, librarians and archivists because, like I said, I'm usually one of 100 or one of 500 people in an organization and to now be in a graduate program that focuses in uh, BIPOC librarianship um, was awesome, right? That was what I needed to understand and see and be able to um, you know, be here today. And so for those who don't know about Knowledge River, I definitely encourage y'all to look up uh, Knowledge River, the program. My director at Berlin, Loa, she's awesome. She's definitely um, uh, recruiting now and maybe if you know someone in your organization, but Knowledge River has been a stepping stone for me. And the other stepping stone is around this time at ASU, because initially I was um, this information desk person, we'll say, and then um, I was able to uh, get exposure to librarian, uh, other areas of librarianship once I became a Knowledge River student. And out of that, I was able to meet Nancy Godoy, who's a Chicano archivist here at ASU. And she's uh, played a pivotal role in really connecting my community, uh, you know, music interests into library, librarianship and for the archives and with their, her work with her team here at ASU, the Community, Dar community Driven Archives Initiative, they've been able to show how that community work can be synthesized through um, repatriative archives, you know, through archival work that's for the community and be able to reclaim our stories and our, our spaces, you know, through the archives. And that really blew my mind because I didn't think ever in a library setting, archive setting, I would be able to do that. So after meeting her and her team, um, that was just really phenomenal for my growth as a professional and also to show that a lot of my interests for my community um, are rooted in who I am, you know, is awesome and be able to experience, you know, um, you know, able to indigenize the profession in that sense. And so after meeting Nancy, let's just say while I was at ASU, they took notice of my interests and what I've shared today and been able to, um, I was um, promoted, we'll say, into a, a second branch of the Labriola Center, um, which was uh, established after the Hayden relocation um, of the center to the West Campus. And initially, it was going to you know, move back, but they realized the importance and impacts it had here on the West Campus, so they needed someone to oversee the West Campus, and uh, that's me. And so here's a little breakdown of this, the history of the Library Oval Center, but um, it was just really um, awesome to be acknowledged and, you know, by administration after hearing about my journey, because when I finished up my undergraduate, um, well, my Dean's Medal, so I had an article about me, and from what I understand, I issue, uh, library administrators saw and read that article, uh, and they decided, hey, like, we need to support this guy. We need to, he has all these, his interest and his passion. Maybe we can um, see if he's interested in helping Labriola, which I did. So I just want to give a thanks to um, the Associate University Librarian, uh, Lori McAllister, because she was, uh, she oversees the Labriola Center under her directorate. And she definitely had the, the vision to help move me over, along with uh, now retired Associate University Librarian, Tom and Lee Doyne who also had that vision too in the Engagement and Learning Services Directorate. So I'm just glad that I was recognized and glad that they approached me and asked how I felt about uh, wanting to pursue this. And I did due to all the reasons I, I kind of built up to in this point in life. And so also to um, recognizing that within there, the Library Elvis Center, the, the curator at the time, a librarian, Joyce Martin, was also in support of that um, because of, you know, she's been in the Library Elvis for over 15, 20 years doing this work and it was just good to have another staff member for one, but let alone a native staff member with my background. And Joyce is a mentor of mine now and she definitely uh, prepared me for what I'm doing now, which is essentially, uh, well, real quick, this is a photo of the two spaces we have. So the one on the left is the Hayden space, the one on the right is the West Campus space. But then as far as my current work uh, with Joyce's promotion <laughs> into a different uh, directorate, I'm now serving as the lead curator and librarian of Labriola 
I lead all engagement activities, and I'm also, with my interest in community-driven archives, been uh, asked to um, finance these teams to oversee the native side of the CDA work. So I oversee and lead that part of um, community-driven archives initiatives here at ASU. And so it's definitely been, you know, kind of a synthesis of what I've shared of my, of my interests, and also knowing that, you know, with folks recognizing and acknowledging, um, I guess, what I can bring to the organization, be able to provide insight and so one area of interest or area I've been able to do that was through the land acknowledgement statement, um, which was crafted by myself and Joyce and another knowledge of student, great part, um, Sanchez and Lori uh, McAllister, like I mentioned, to help um, really put forth a vision of how we see, um, you know, what, what life or how the ASU library can support indigenous knowledge. And as you heard in the beginning, that is, um, you know, with the advocates is the main word in there. And so myself, you know, being an advocate in Labriola, I've definitely been supported by um, administration to help, you know, on certain topics. So example, um, we had an issue around mail policies, you know, around uh, not mailing to rural boxes or um, PO boxes and rural route boxes on reservations. But after uh, consulting my uh, after bringing, to, bringing brought up to um, an admin by another native staff member and then myself going through what needed to be done, we were able to update that policy along with also understanding just the digital divide, especially with COVID and everything going on. And so I guess my insight on just how it is on the res has been helpful and it's been heard and it's been, um, been implemented in some way or form in, in our policies. So I, I do appreciate that. And so I know I've been talking nonstop here, but I just wanted to do a quick overview of this community impact and what it means to have a meaningful inclusion, right? Coming as a native person in these spaces and so as a photo here of one of our community driven archives events we had out in Salt River, in Salt River Fema Maricopa Indian community, um, I think right before COVID hit as well. And so it was an awesome day. And I think Lourdes will actually speak more towards the community driven archive side of it and what it means for our communities. So I'll let her break that down um, when we get to her section. And then also in response, you know, been able to craft a community COVID-19 resource guide for native people. And um, this was definitely circulated far and wide um, had a native community. Um, it was more of a, a community live guide that I reached out to various uh, native uh, student support organizations to best craft the resources we need to initially support ASU native students, but then beyond um, this natives as a whole um, using this resource guide. And then of course, back to like standard type of ways of engagement book displays. And I'm uh, quite proud of this display here because it was an initiative put forth by my student workers um, they wanted to do a book display, but they wanted to do it around the theme of land back, which for all, or if you're not familiar with it, I'm not sure if you can read completely the slide here, but it's part of a larger movement to have these conversations around land and acknowledging um, just the impacts of settler colonialism and what we should do and how we should be empowered to um, get our land back. And so the students here are, were able to make a display and it was able to cover six different themes. Um, which are highlighted by them and they had like, a similar type of card or you know board here depicting why they um, put it up and the importance of it and so it was student driven it was their voices and um, in the spirit of land back uh, we're not taking it down after Native American Heritage Month because every month should be Native American Heritage Month so as of now uh, talking with folks we're going to keep up the display in some capacity and put it more more visible areas but yeah that is uh, a student initiative um, based on their thoughts on the topic. And then the last thing I'll share before I transition to Lourdes is that uh, I wanted to share just, uh, you know, of course it's a lot of text here, I apologize, but it was uh, part of an email uh, or a, from a student group, their name's Indigenous Native Student Group, and they had uh, some thoughts and feedback on the book display I just showed. And I had a couple of testimonials like this of, you know, why it's important. But as you can read, you know, here, it definitely shows our impacts here at Labriola and what we're doing to be meaningful and inclusive to our communities and who, we, um, who we're here to support, while at the same time educating non-natives on what we're talking about in these areas to help challenge, you know, some of the uh, settler privilege we have in our, um, you know, institutions. So I feel ASU has done an awesome job to be able to create that space to support uh, who I am as a native person in this type of work. And as, you know, shown here, you know, it definitely has high impact with our students and so at this point, I'm going to transition to Lourdes because I'm talking for way too long. And um, I'll go from there. So uh, we'll circle back at the end to wrap up. But Lourdes, when you're ready. Stop. Uh, 
Well, thank you so much, Alex, first for the introduction and with everything you're saying, it's just, um, it, it's really awesome to be in a, in a space like this and you sharing that type of knowledge with everyone. And I appreciate everyone too, just coming out and taking note of this as well. Um, so yes, uh, there's no need for much of an introduction. I'm Lourdes Pereira. Um, I'm a sophomore here at, at ASU and I'm a worker. I'm an aide for Labriola. I've been working for Labriola for about a, a year now. In January, it, it'll be a year. And um, uh, like I said uh, before, I, I'm Hyachiratham, but at this time we're actually not a federally, uh, federally recognized tribe. So coming to Labriola and being able to work here at Labriola was just very powerful for me as um, a, a non-federally recognized, uh, coming from a non-federally recognized tribe, because this space, the Labriola space, just holds so much knowledge and so much um, there's there's so much material for us as students and even as a as a student who is indigenous and coming from a community who's not federally recognized I was actually able to learn more about my people and um, actually have more opportunities to to dive into that with a lot of the materials that Labriola holds and um, even like and, and I'm going back a little bit of with what Alex said having people like us in these spaces is it, just um, from for myself as a student it it makes it even better because when we're talking about vocabulary like alex stated you know when we're talking about genocide or settler colonialism or colonization or you know a, a lot of these vocabulary words can make other people feel uncomfortable and of course you can be an ally to indigenous peoples you can be an ally to you know native peoples but you won't fully understand a lot of the pains and a lot of the hardships we have had to go through so to have um, someone in this space that really acknowledges that and knows that and um, creating spaces for students, uh, indigenous students, as you saw in the previous uh, picture before, it, it helps and supports us as indigenous stu students during our journey within higher uh, education. And for myself outside of that with my journey as just even being an indigenous person. So to have a, a space like Labriola is, is just incredible and also uh, hiring people and having people in these spaces that not just look like us, but understand and have that knowledge of what it really is to be indigenous or, or you know, um, native and, you know, have that knowledge of, of Indian countries and things like that. Uh, Labriola has just done an amazing job with even being uh, involved within the community. Uh, my, my freshman year, I was actually super involved with uh, Ind Indigenous, which is the only Native American student organization here at West Campus, and Alliance of Indigenous Peoples, as well as Tribal Nations Tour. There's a, a lot of things to get involved in here at ASU. And it what really uh, caught my eye as well is that Labriola had this strong connection within the community, within the Indigenous community and outside of that as well, with bringing, uh, we, um, we hold different events, which this year was virtual because of COVID, but before that it was uh, our open mic night, which is really cool. And you have artists come and uh, poets and, and people just all together coming in and just sharing some of their stories and, and different things like that, which is really great. And also participating within Native American Heritage Month, some events like that, and Indigenous Culture Week. It was just really great to see an organization that's already doing so much just within, you know, the library setting and things like that and kind of recreating these types of structures but also uh, connecting within the community which uh, is really great and um, so so a push for myself that led me to Labriola one day uh, I don't know if everyone really knows about what's happening and I, I don't mean to be too political as well but my homelands uh, the Hyachiratham ancestral homelands right now are um, facing a lot of uh, uh, destruction with the border wall and Recently, in, in the news, which it has shown a lot, is the Quito Paquito Springs, but for autumn we call it Advaipia. And I was actually last year trying to search for this book that my uh, great grandmother wrote about the Quito Paquito cemeteries, and it led me to Labriola. So I came on my way. I was able to find a, a person available right away and he helped me get the whole book PDF version and then I just started um, talking to him we started actually talking about a whole a lot of things about the language and my culture and things like that and I ended up writing a tiny little section in, in Labriola's uh, news uh, it was like their news article or like their news their newspapers that they that they keep out 
And um, then I, I just was really intrigued with Labriola and, and started doing that, which, which leads to the community-driven archives that Labriola has held. So with the community-driven archives, uh, we were actually even able to write and, and talk more about this with uh, Turning Points magazine, which is just uh, a magazine led by indigenous peoples, by Native, Native American peoples, which is really great here at, at ASU. And with, within uh, Community Driven Archives, what, what Labriola does is really give the indigenous community, the tribal communities around, uh, around Arizona, a space to reclaim their own archives, like really going to the communities and saying, you can do this yourself. I know Alex did touch on it a little bit, but you know we don't really see that within with any industry really in certain industries, uh, giving indigenous peoples or native peoples that own voice because for the most part you just see it in a museum or what we face too with a lot of different things uh, that I have seen with Alex and, and his efforts that a lot of uh, native peoples are scared just to donate or to uh, share some of their archives because they think that an, uh, an industry is just going to take it, which has happened a lot with indigenous peoples. And when we're talking about anthropology or we're talking about archives, it's, it's something that just gets taken away. And with community driven archives, it's a space for indigenous peoples to reclaim that and to say, we don't really need these big industries to come out and, and come to our communities for us to archive and and hold these materials sacred which uh community driven archives even emphasizes on pr preservation and things like that for our communities so it's been really great uh, experience for me myself personally coming from which the, this picture that alex has is was from the turning points magazine the little photo shoot we had within labriola so those are actually some of my own family's archive the book that i was talking about before is is in that picture as well um my seal the hiachiratam seal is on the top left so it's it's really it's very powerful for the indigenous community and for Labriola to be pushing this for at least the indigenous communities, the Native American communities, is amazing. And so for myself, I have even tried to, or and, and it's in the works, of course, but with me and uh, Alex, because my tribe at the moment is trying to be federally recognized through an act of Congress, we are trying to preserve our own materials. And hopefully we're going to be setting up a community driven archive with Labriola or just doing some works with Labriola to see how we can better preserve our own materials. So of course it's great to look at each community and each family, but this could even be as big as preserving tribal information, tribal knowledge. And, um, you know, for an industry like ASU, it's just really great to have that support for your students, for the communities, and even something as big as as, as tribes that are trying to uh, be federally recognized as well. So uh, it's just, it was really great to share a little bit of, of my story with everyone. And I'm really fortunate that Labriola, that there is a space here at ASU for Labriola because it has done so much for the community and within a uh, course within the library as well but I would take so, so much notes on just what Labriola is doing and keeping a lookout because there of course are more events and ways for everyone else to get involved with some of the efforts that Labriola is putting on but it's it's uh, an honor and a privilege to be here to speak on behalf of Labriola and just get the opportunity to work with Alex uh, and a lot of the things that they're coming up with so thank you so much and I really appreciate it again so Sapa that's okay. Thoughtful, thank you, Lourdes. Um, so that being said, like I said, we were the guinea pigs here, the case studies, that was how I framed it because, um, you know, there's really, uh, my experience is just this really having an open mind and open heart to see, you know, how libraries and archives can help the native people. And as shared in my story, shared in, in Lourdes' story, you know, how we can, um, you know, use it to our advantage, you know, for our, our, our culture and our life leads. Um, to me, that's, you just can't checklist that. And that was why I titled this presentation that, because, um, you know, like I said, there's no one size fits all approach for providing library services to indigenous populations or working to recruit and retain indigenous library staff. Um, so, I mean, there's definitely things you can pull from, you know, what I shared, you know, at least going into um, the Knowledge River program and so on, or, being here at ASU, being able to share. But um, 
I think a lot of times when people, um, I guess to, in, a, in a roundabout way, I guess it, it's a lot of times people hear, you know, these type of stories or grievances of, you know, on the flip side of like the negative things, they force to, they run to a checklist to say, hey, well, maybe we can fix this by doing a land statement, or maybe we have a diversity training for the sake of having it, or maybe we need to ask the one native guy there, the BIPOC person there. Or, you know, how about we just do uh, a Native American Heritage Month display and have books that are, you know, one, maybe probably not by Native authors, and two, um, maybe a historical um, or shares more of a historical perspective and not Native in the current in, uh, time. So as you saw uh, with the book display, as you heard from Lourdes with just her journey to get here, as you saw, you know, see with Community Driven Archives, you know, it's, it's really more of a deeper commitment to wanting to um, include us and to like listen and be able to identify maybe people in your ranks in your organization now who are native who are maybe in a staff position who might have some interest to want to um, pursue this line of work but feel like they're not empowered to do so because they just one they're maybe first generation like myself or two um, maybe that work environment has been hostile and not open and progressive in a way to be, be open and share and so it takes a lot of listening, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And that's why here I made it a point to say uh, land statements are not a good idea if you're not talking to natives, especially if you're um, including um, tribes in the statement that are no longer uh, referred in the way that you, you, you um, listed them on there. Because maybe the tribe has changed their name to, um, for example, with my tribe, you know, up to 1986, uh, was referred to as the Papago Indian tribe. And that was just the name that how the government, you know, uh, signed our reservation. But we're Thonautham. Thonautham means the desert people. And so around the time I was born, they decided to change the name um, to say, hey, we're Autham. You know, we don't want to be Papago. We're not Pima. These are all colonial names. And so I'll just say that I saw a statement recently that um, noted that. And I was uh, very disturbed by that. But I think it all leads to what I just shared here today around if you're not having meaningful consultation, meaningful co communication, meaningful anything, really, you're going to have, uh, you know, missteps like that. And so, although I will say if your organization is actually really trying to um, address these issues in a meaningful way and identifying what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong, and you're really wanting to have a conversation around this, then yeah, when you are able to then put forth an initiative like a land statement, it has more meaning, has more impact because it shows that this is what we're doing right now at this time and this is what we're gonna do. And to quote my my boss, my you know, Lord McAllister, who I mentioned earlier, who oversees Labriola, one thing she's always said to me with land statements, they're really vision statements, you know, because ultimately, you know, we want to turn that into more than a a land statement, right? It should be a land policy statement, it should be more op operationalized. So, anyways. That's uh, what's my rundown, uh, why you shouldn't checklist these things. And then of course it leads back to these awesome impacts, right? That I started at the beginning and you're able to then uh, incorporate that um, into your organization. So um, yeah, I think that's that's my time. I think I know I went over a little bit, but thank you all, so. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, we don't have any questions just yet. Uh, for the audience, I did just put in a um, survey that we ask that you fill out for Alex's presentation so we can have valuable feedback and we can give Alex valuable feedback. Um, I did want to mention uh, Alex is actually working on this is finals week for you, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> uh, so so I two more assignments and I'm done with grad school. So I have an assignment due at midnight tonight. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for taking your time uh, today to do this presentation for us. It is so valuable to us and congratulations on finishing your MLIS. That is wonderful. Uh, and we are so proud of you and, and congratulate you on that success and can't wait to see what you do in the future and how you uh, help us change and innovate libraries here in Arizona. So um, yeah, we just had a comment. Thank you, Alex and Lourdes as well. Thank you for um, having her here and, and both of your stories, just very important. So. Uh, for sharing your perspectives on this into, uh, important topic. So if we did have any questions for Alex, go ahead and get them submitted. Again, please fill out that survey. Just to like... clarify with the shared screen, did I turn it off? I'm not sure if I yes. did. Yep, nope, you're good. We're just, just seeing you now. Cool. 
All right, no, well, no questions. Thank you again, Alex. We really appreciate your time. Uh, we know it's very valuable. Good luck on your finals. And again, congratulations. Thank you all. See you all soon enough and uh, I'll be done with school. So <laughs> thank you so much. So bye. All right, we're going to go ahead and just have uh, another short break. Uh, grab a bite to eat, take a stretch. We will resume at 12.15, or I'm sorry, 
All right, welcome back everyone. We will now have a few vendor presentations and then our closing awards ceremony. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar and all of our webinar sessions for this series. Our first video presentation is from janway.com. Thank you to Janway for your sponsorship. Up next, we have a video presentation for BroDart.
Thank you so much, Dina and Lori, for that great presentation. And thank you for your sponsorship from BroadArt. Uh, Our next presentation, we have Christine Peterson here, the Engagement and Emerging Technologies Coordinator for Amigos Library Services. She will be discussing a few of the Amigo services that ASLA members might find useful and some updates. Christine, you're muted. We, we don't uh, have to. Is there that better? Go. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Should, are you seeing a screen at this point? We are seeing your screen as well, yes. Wonderful. So let me just give you a few minutes of what is going on at Amigos. Uh, Amigos is a, is a nonprofit. We are a member-based organization. Let me get to the next slide. A member-based nonprofit. If you're interested, we are a 501c3. We are librarians. Most of us at Amigos have worked in libraries over the years. And when you start looking at what we do, we have missions and visions. Uh, at our organization, we try to unite libraries for action and strength within their communities. And we hope that the services that we have are indispensable to libraries that are our members. If you're interested, if you've never heard of us before, this is a map that shows you where our members are. As you can see, some of you who have been with us for a long time may remember that our historical um, area was Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas. Uh, we added Missouri a number of years ago, but Amigos now is primarily a national consortium. So we do have states across the United States and we actually do have um, Bermuda as well. We have a couple of international libraries. Uh, a little bit of who we are, about half of our members are academic libraries and about a quarter are public. It's interesting in Arizona, we have tw um, 22 members in Arizona and about half are academic and half are public. So it's split just about down the middle for them, for, you, for your state. So I wanna spend just a little bit of time highlighting a couple of things um, at Amigo. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about services that come with membership. These are services that once you become a member, there's no additional charge for. And so I have a number of them here. I just, I'm gonna talk quickly about all of them and then go into depth on one. So obviously the conference is a once a year in May and there is continuing education there at that conference. Um, we will help you with your jobs and getting those, those unfilled jobs filled. We have a free RDA toolkit subscription if you have um, catalogers that are using RDA. We also within OCLC do support a couple of groups for reciprocal borrowing. And on the vendor side, a discount direct program, which gives you an immediate discount for specific vendors. You don't have to go through us. But I do wanna talk really quickly about the online conferences and the know and go sessions. If there's one thing that Amigos is known for, it's continuing education. And as a member, you have access to both of these types of continuing education throughout the year. So some of the types of um, online conferences that we've had over the years have to do with uh, EDI, Equity, Div Diversity and Inclusion was last, just last week, sharing innovations, a culture, creating and cultivating careers, innovative technical services workflows, all of those are conferences that we've had and those sessions are available to members even after the conference is over. You might have seen, um, we have one on migrating library content that is in February. So if you're interested in that, that one's upcoming and registration is open. For um, on no and go sessions, these are hour long sessions throughout the year. It really runs the gamut. Beginning genealogy, how to hire the right person, rights management within catalog records, um, RDA 3R updates, just a lot of information across that. So for members, there's a lot of, of benefits that come. In addition, there are benefits that are discounted with membership. So for the most part, people who are non-members can use these, but they will pay a higher price. So a couple of these, um, obviously the continuing education we've talked about, uh, in this case, we're talking about actual classes, vendors, we, have, um, we actually deal with vendors and provide discounts to you on vendors. Ask Academic is a chat reference service. Association management helps us support other nonprofits. But really what I wanna focus on here is Courier and Simply E. These are the two 
that um, I want to talk to Arizona libraries about. So we've been doing Courier for approximately 20 years. Uh, with Courier, we, we pride ourselves on fast delivery of materials, depending on how quickly, one, three, or five day delivery. Uh, we try to keep everything um, economic. We have connections to other Courier services, and we try to be very flexible with our libraries. Most people think of this as an interlibrary loan service, and certainly it is. But if you have anything that's going to another courier library and that's small, that will fit in the bag, that's unbreakable, as long as it fits in the bag, we'll take it. And the wonderful thing about this is that it's flat rate for the year. So when you're budgeting, it makes it a whole lot easier to budget postage. We do have our states down here, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas are the four states that we serve, but we also have connections to a couple of other courier services in Kansas and Missouri, and of course they connect out from there. As I said, we do have service options, one, uh, two, three, and five day options. We also do a customized service. We actually do a service for just four libraries within a county. They're so far apart that it's difficult for them to share materials. So we run a, a custom courier service just within that county. So just a couple of things to think about as you're thinking about courier. The second service I want to talk to you about is Simply E. This is an app. It's an open source app that was developed for li by libraries for libraries. And the idea is to bring together multiple content providers of ebooks and audiobooks into a single app. So you see we have here in this um, in this uh, what do you call it in this image uh, that we do deal with both ebooks and audiobooks. And I will say that last August was our last major audiobook provider. We were able to finally bring in Overdrive Audiobooks, which was that we have been waiting for that for over a year. The app is open source, which means that you can um, implement it yourself if you like. We do authenticate patrons through a public library ILS. If you are an academic library, academic functionality is coming, and we are starting to work with single sign-on for academic libraries. Uh, for most libraries, it is hosted. Uh, Amigos is one of those hosting providers, but you can host it yourself. So if you're interested in that, let us know. We'll help you with that. And it really is a discovery service. For ebooks and audiobooks, it is a discovery service. So it is an app, both iOS and a Google app, Android app. Just an example of some of the screens you'll see. On the left-hand side is an opening screen for a small public library in Texas. You can see the lanes, which can be customized. The middle section gives you a list of the titles that I have out right now, um, ones that I have not even downloaded yet, plus one that I'm ready to read. And on the, the right-hand side, an example of the reader that we use. So one question I get a lot is, what vendors are, are already integrated. Uh, this is a list of those vendors. Some of them you'll see here are the DPLA Exchange, Overdrive, Access 360, Cloud Library, BiblioBoard, RB Digital. Uh, you'll also notice that EBSCO's Novelist is integrated as well as Google In Analytics and a few of the more free, freely available collections as well. So what's going on at Amigos? For those of you who are members, just really quickly, registration is open for that February online conference. Non-members are welcome to come. Members don't have to pay, that would be the difference. But migrating content and data, it's gonna be a great conference. One of the things that we've been doing this fall is supporting other online conferences uh, for other associations because of the pandemic and not being able to meet. We have been doing um, we've been doing our part, as uh, you have been doing your part, in helping to support other organizations get their conferences done in an online environment. A few of the new classes we have, so basic SQL, library services to teens, scholarly metrics. We have a micro-credentialing service for meta uh, metadata management, patron-driven acquisition, self-care, and this is just a few of them. And then of course we have some hands-on classes on Simply E since we already support that. And the big thing for us is we have a new CEO. And if you have not yet met Miguel, you really should. You will enjoy meeting him. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to AZLA and thank you for the few minutes to tell you about what's going on at Amigos. Christine, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for that presentation. We really appreciate your sponsorship here.
Thank you. Our last presentation features two short videos from Gail. Thank you to all of our sponsors uh, for helping our ASLA webinar series. Again, we hope you've enjoyed today's session. We will be ending with a presentation of awards and some closing remarks by our president. So we will bring back John Walsh to present this year's service award winners. Hi, John. Oh, uh, clear my, my webcam. Thank you, Carly. And I'm proud to present the 2020 Service Award winners. This year's award nominations were very competitive, and this year's winners represent some of the brightest talent in Arizona librarianship. First up, 
the winner of the 2020 Newton and Betty Rosenzweig Distinguished Service Award is Renee Tanner from Arizona State University Library. She is also the ASLA treasurer. She should win an award for that, uh, that too. Renee Tanner is an associate librarian at ASU in the STEM division. She started her career as an academic librarian at Montana State University in 2008 and joined ASU in 2011. Congratulations, Ray, and great job. I can't thank you enough for all your service to Arizona librarianship and ASLA. Next, the winner of the 2020 ASLA Outstanding Library Service Award. This is Janine Van Llewellyn of Buckeye Public Library. Congratulations, Janine. Great work and thank you for your service. Janine is a library assistant too, who develops and oversees the education of entrepreneurship and outreach efforts for the Buckeye Public Library System. She taught K through eight music and technology for six years and served as the community outreach coordinator for Liberty District for four years. Director of Arts Education for the West Valley Arts Council for three years, and most recently has overseen the education and entrepreneurship outreach efforts for the Buckeye Public Library System for the past five years. Um, congratulations, Janine, and great work. Thank you for your service to Arizona library, librarianship. Now, Janine's director, Jan White, would like to say a few words in recognition of Jan of Janine. Good evening, John, or good afternoon, John. I'm already making the day go uh, farther along here. Um, thank you so much on behalf of the Buckeye Public Library System for allowing us to participate in this uh, award ceremony today. Um, hats off to the folks from the Arizona Library Association conference committee, as well as the awards committee. It's trying times for us all, and you guys have done a great job putting everything together for today's um, event. Um, and just a little bit about Janine. Those who know me know I always have plenty to say, but um, I don't even know where to begin with Janine. Janine started with us in 2015, um, coming from a no, uh, no library background. She was a lightning speed educator herself on on entrepreneurship and business and development, and she excelled. It is truly her passion for people and the passion to make change for success that really has truly driven this program. And this program is um, known not just um, here in Buckeye, but also nationwide. And, and even uh, folks from Australia have joined in on some of her sessions that she's put together. So um, Janine is one that really, truly engages, connects, and inspires individuals and groups and businesses. And we are just very fortunate to have her in Buckeye, at the Buckeye Public Library System. So congratulations, Janine, and we look forward to many, many more um, opportunities to, to further the program and create new ones. Thanks, John. The winner of the 2020 ASLA Sharon G. Womack Outstanding Library Technician Award is Alma Schaefer of the Pima County Public Library. Alma was born in Lima, Sonora, Mexico and holds a bachelor degree in business administration and education. She spent 10 years working as an administrator and specialized job counselor. And she also has six years experience in early childhood and special education. She has spent the last five years as the Children's Service Library Associate and Circulation Manager of Santa Rosa Library. Congratulations, Alma. We appreciate all you do for your library and thank you for your service to Arizona librarianship. Alma would like to say a few words. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, ACLA. I just want to say that I'm very honored to receive this award. And uh, when I started my position at the Santa Rosa Library, it was a career change for me that I looked for because one of my dreams since I was a child, it was to work at the library. I love being able to work with the community, neighboring agencies, organizations, schools, authors, 
and creating programs. All this allowed me to have the opportunity to enhance programs and services in a creative way, like for example, adding science, art, and other STEAM concepts that make all the more the fun. I really enjoy my position at the library. It makes me so happy and I feel fulfilled by it. Uh, I love being part of Pima County Public Library. Uh, just to add a little more about uh, the programs that the Santa Rosa Library is located at the Santa Rosa neighborhood, which uh, houses a lot of families and children. The library is also adjacent to the K through eight school and an early childhood center and a recreation center, which allows us to interact with uh, many different people and lots of children. And I realized early on the need to cultivate relationships with families and children by sharing information and resources. Uh, several years ago, the after school snack program started here and um, because there was a great need for nutrition for children who were visiting the library after school. The program served healthy and nutrition snacks for students during the school year and then expanded to summer snacks as well. In these difficult times, I realized that children and families weren't receiving enough nutrition, especially since schools were closed and working collaboratively and effectively with the Community Food Bank of Southern Arizona and strengthening the already established agency market partnership made possible to spend uh, the snack program to adults and families at the Santa Rosa area, obtaining an additional snack and food items and supplemented the regularly provided snack for children. And families were benefiting from this additional food item as they were utilizing it for um, full meals. And then I love um, my job and making the library accessible for people and providing programs that serve the community allowed me to break down the many limitations. And I'm very happy and that was able to fulfill what the community needed. And um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, John. And thank you, Ama, for all the work you do at your library. Now the winner of the 2020 ASLA Outreach Service Award. This is Nicole Umayam, Digital Inclusion Consultant for the Arizona State Library. As a Digital Inclusion Library Consultant at the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records, Nicole supports small, rural, urban, tribal, and academic libraries throughout Arizona on digital equity initiatives, including Wi-Fi hotspot and laptop lending, tech training for librarians, community-based digital preservation, and improving library broadband networks. This work was kick-started through participation in the National Digital Inclusion Alliance Project, the Digital Inclusion Corps. She has an MA in Applied Linguistics and an MLIS from the University of Oklahoma. Congratulations, Nicole, and thank you for your work at the State Library, and thank you for all your service to Arizona librarianship. Now the winner of the 2020 ASLA Outstanding Youth Services Librarian Award is Caitlin Burns from Pima County Public Library. All right, Pima County, represent. Caitlin was worked, <coughs> has worked for Pima County Library since 2005. She began at the PCPL SNAP program in 2013, which was awarded an honorable mention in the wellness, safety, and sustainability category by the Urban Libraries Council the following year. The program has since expanded to 12 libraries serving thousands of meals to Tucson area children and teens each school year. Until recently, Caitlin was Children's Services Manager at Joel D. Valdez Main Library in Tucson, where she oversaw a renovation of 9,000 square foot children's room. Funded in part by an IMLS Lister grant, thanks to the Arizona State Library. Caitlin now manages the Nanini Library in Northwest Tucson. Congratulations, Caitlin. Thank you for all your work with the youth of your community, and thank you for your service to Arizona librarianship. Next, the winner of the 2020 Follette School Librarian of the Year Award. This year, it's Lisa Morris Wilkie from Casa Grande Elementary Unified School District. 
Lisa is currently a teacher librarian at Casa Grande Middle School, as well as lead librarian for the Casa Grande Elementary School District. She has been an educator and school librarian in Casa Grande since 1991. Her passion is helping her students find the right book at just the right time. Lisa is the current co-chair of the International Literacy Association's Young Adult Choices Committee, a member of the Children's Author Committee for the Tucson Festival of Books, and has been a member of the American Association of School Librarians Conference Committee. <clears throat> Lisa lives in Casa Grande with her husband, Eric. Congratulations, Lisa. Uh, I'd like to give you a special thanks, Lisa. I don't know if school librarians get thanked enough or told just how important they are in the realm of librarianship and the youth of our communities. So thank you, Lisa, for working with the students in your school, and thank you for your service to Arizona librarianship. Next up, the winner of the 2020 Friends of Oro Valley Public Library Support Staff Scholarship Award. This year, it's Heather, <coughs> Heather Severson from Pima County Public Library. If this were the Oscars, these guys would be coming a runaway here. Heather is a program instructor at the PCPL, where she helps people use library resources to achieve their goals of personal development, career advancement, and lifelong learning. She's worked to support learning in a variety of settings, including the University of Arizona, Pima Community College, and the National Math and Science Initiative. She started iSchool at the University of Washington in 2018 and expects to graduate in June 2021. Congratulations, Heather. <clears throat> Library support staff are who keep the doors open, so thank you for all your service to your library and thank you for your service to Arizona librarianship. Now the winner of the 2020 ASLA Library Volunteer of the Year Award. This year it's Robert Marlowe from Parker Public Library. I have a statement here from Robert that I'll, uh, I'd like to read. My name is Robert Marlowe. I moved across the street from the Parker Public Library in Parker, Arizona in 2014. At that time, I was very shy and did not like to be around many people. I went to the library to use a public computer one day, and the ladies there asked me to help move some boxes. The next day, I decided to walk across the street to see if they needed more help. They were grateful for the nice gesture. I continued going to the library to help with whatever was needed. The ladies working there were friendly and it was nice to do something for others. I've been volunteering at the library now for six years. I go there every single day, they are open. The staff and friends of the library are my family. We all work together to make our town a better place. I always knew God had a plan for me and I'm thankful to be part of this team. Thank you for picking me for this award. I am honored. Well, congratulations, Robert, and a special thank you to you also. I don't know if volunteers get the uh, recognition and thanks they deserve all the time. So thank you so much for all your service to your library and your community, and thank you for your service to Arizona librarianship. Now the winner of the 2020 ASLA Louise A. Stevens Memorial Scholarship. This year, it's Cheryl Orman. And guess what? She's from Pima County Public Library too. Cheryl is a student member of ASLA. And when I interviewed her for a newsletter article, she expressed great gratitude to ASLA for the support. Cheryl grew up in a large family who all enjoyed trips to the public library. And she continues to be an avid patron of the PCPL. She attended the University of Arizona and worked several jobs before obtaining a position at the Murphy Wilmot branch of the Pima County Public Library System. She worked there for over 10 years and now attends the University of Arizona's School of Information and Library Science. Cheryl recently moved to a new position at the Wheeler Taft Abbott Senior Branch Library. When not working or doing homework, she can be found volunteering at the Friends of the Pima County Public Library, playing chess 
swimming, or spending time with her family. Congratulations, Cheryl. I so enjoyed our conversation when we met. Best of luck on your librarianship journey. And thank you for all your service to your library and your service to Arizona librarianship. Oh, um, well, we're gonna back it up a little. I guess Dan Stanton is gonna say a few words about Renee Tanner, whom he nominated for her award. Go ahead, Dan. Thank you, John. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, share the, the nomination letter that I wrote for Renee. Um, this is a, a very special award uh, for AZLA. And I just wanted to share um, why I uh, wanted to nominate Renee and just to show her as a, an exemplary uh, colleague uh, at Arizona State University and in librarianship. So here's the letter I wrote. Um, thank you to the committee for this opportunity to nominate our colleague Renee Tanner for the Newton and Betty Rosenzweig Distinguished Service Award. In addition to having the had the pleasure of working directly with Renee at Arizona State University since January of 2011. I have witnessed the impact she has had on the library profession, both at the state level through her active leadership roles in the Arizona Library Association and nationally through her groundbreaking work with the American Library Association Sustainability Roundtable. In her day-to-day -day work, Ms. Tanner is competent, collegial, and kind. Given the size of Arizona State University, we all take on a variety of roles to keep things moving forward, and I am always appreciative of opportunities to work closely with Renee. In addition to her dedication to the teaching and research mission of ASU as life sciences librarian, Renee has found creative ways to expand the reach of the library into the ASU community by creating the ASU Science Book Discussion Group, starting the ASU Seed Library before seed libraries became commonplace, and curating exhibits to highlight the breadth and depth of our science collections. Shortly after starting at ASU, Ms. Tanner volunteered to serve as the junior AZLA conference co-chair, as no small feat, as I'm sure you all know, uh, utilizing the skills and experience gained previously in Montana to jump in and contribute to her new home. I clearly remember Renee making the rounds at the conference with clipboard in hand, speaking with vendors, presenters, volunteers, and resort staff, making notes about what worked and what didn't. Those notes formed the basis of her approach for chairing the conference the next year. She is currently in her third and final year as AZLA's treasurer, and I credit her immediate flagging of AZLA's dire financial straits and her decisive recommendations for AZLA leadership with not only saving the association financially, but with diversifying and increasing our funding options. At the national level, Renee incorporated her personal interest in environmental resilience into her professional interests and worked as part of ALA's nascent sustainability roundtable, quote, to preserve resources for the library community to support sustainability through curriculum development, collections, exhibits, events, advocacy, communication, library buildings, and space design, end quote. Elected to roundtable leadership by her dedicated colleagues from across the library spectrum, Renee was a critical part of the team that introduced, advocated for, and achieved attaining sustainability as the latest of our 12 core values of librarianship. It's clear to me that Renee Tanner is deserving of the Newton and Betty Rosenzweig Distinguished Service Award. And I also want to thank uh, our colleagues, uh, Michelle Simon uh, and Rebecca Aldred Smith for writing letters of support for Renee. Congratulations, Renee. Thanks a lot, Dan, and uh, thank you, Renee, for all you do for uh, ASLA. Um, so finally, the 2020 Grand Canyon Reader Award winners. In the picture book category, 
Amy Fellner Domini. In the nonfiction category, Annette Pimento. In the intermediate category, Victoria Jameson. In the tween category, Alan Gratz. And in the tween nonfiction category, Patricia O'Connell Pearson. Thank you all, and congratulations to the Grand Canyon Reader Award winners of 2020. Well, that is the conclusion of our closing session. I have to again thank Carly and her crew for everything that they did to bring this together. I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. I need to reiterate the words I closed the opening session with to all Arizona librarianship. I think we need each other now more than ever. Libraries need each other. We are stronger and can make more of an impact together. We the library workers, we're asthma. We build strong libraries and strong libraries bring, build strong communities. This brings an end to the annual year and the start of the next annual year, which will be held in Prescott, Arizona on October 27th through 29th, 2021. The theme will be moving the boundaries of librarianship, leading from Arizona. And now at the close of the um, conference, I will do the symbolic passing of the gavel from the last president to the new president. Thank you all for, um, for joining. Be well and be safe, everyone.